Hello, this is the Stories Beside channel. I release videos every day for you. Subscribe and click the bell. William Peterson nodded and glanced at his watch, thinking Kelly hadn't called. Hadn't there been time all day? The night shift had not been easy. Three surgeries was no joke. The man felt like he was a goner. Abruptly standing up from his chair, he took off his robe, cap and all carefully hung in the locker. Once dressed, he looked around the office once more, corrected the folders with documents. He got up, caught on his cell phone and went out. Surgeon of the highest category Kotovsky liked it when everything lay neatly in its place. Passing the resident, he shouted to colleagues I do not have a quiet duty. And going down the stairs, again looked at the clock. Where's Kelly? The alarm beeped. He was about to open the car door. He was called out, out of breath, by a nurse. William Peterson. Hold on. There's a major multi-vehicle accident nearby. All the victims are being rushed to us. I can't handle a large number of casualties alone. And with both ORs prepped and the car closed, the man hurried back to the clinic. People needed him. It was already the second day the doctor was on his feet, and it was unknown when it would be over. 21 people were admitted to the hospital. Of course, not everyone made it to the operating room. And as they say, thank God, most of the nurses made bandages and determined in the wards. When the doctor arrived and changed his clothes and entered the operating room number two, he saw a woman on the table. And when he looked at her face, he cried out in surprise. In front of him lay William's spouse, Kelly. He diagnosed several internal injuries, severe concussions, and a very bruised face. Without wasting a second, the vests went to work. Three long hours the doctor labored and during this time stopped internal bleeding, did surgery on his leg, removed all the shrapnel from his face. But to be honest, it was even more frightening. It was clear to everyone that if she survived, plastic surgery would be required after recovery. At five o'clock o'clock it was all over. Three could not be saved. They died on the operating tables with injuries incompatible with life. Corver couldn't feel his legs or his back. And when he came out of surgery, William was waiting for him. I operated on your wife. What do you mean you operated on her? She was in a car accident. Forgetting his fatigue, he flew to the emergency room. Even with bandages and a disfigured face, he recognized his Kelly. The man couldn't hold back the tears. He loved his Kelly more than anything in the world. 18 years of married life, two beautiful boys and love still. He looked at the gauges. While everything was working, his wife was unconscious. Kelly, Kelly, love. How on earth did this happen? He asked, knowing no one would answer him. The driver of the truck didn't slow down on a curve and the huge truck skidded. It flipped over and crushed several cars, leaving no chance for whoever was behind the wheel. Kelly was already in the driveway of the clinic sitting relaxed, listening to music, and didn't even have time to react and slow down. As it turned out on the hood, drinking out the windshield. The last thing she heard was the chords of a waltz, and then darkness and silence. William Peterson gingerly touched his arm, but he didn't even turn around. William Peterson, get some sleep. I've put you in the study. No, I can't leave her. Don't worry, I'm fine. But finally, realizing that he was tired to the point where he could pass out at any minute, he agreed to go lie down. When he woke up six hours later, he scolded the nurse for not waking him up. So your wife's still unconscious. How can you help her? I was surprised to hear the nurse justify herself. Yes, I guess you're right. Make some coffee, please. Well, she brought him coffee and a couple of homemade cakes, which the doctor swallowed without even noticing. Maybe you should go home. Kelly's alive. If you need a consult, we'll be in touch. And to everyone's surprise, he agreed, taking his bag, he left the hospital, which felt heavy with an atmosphere of despair and human suffering. Of course, the doctors kept the situation under control, but they were unable to give any comforting information to the relatives of the victims, who came to the clinic and now looked at the people in white coats with tear-wet eyes, pleading. There remained a swift wait. William Peterson showered at home, then called the clinic a couple of times in half an hour, but always heard the same answer. No change. Alive. The man put the cell phone down on the table and directed a blank stare at it. 
Suddenly the phone rang, making the man flinch. William grabbed the gadget, but his son's name popped up on the screen. Dad, you're all right, he spoke, in a slightly worried voice. Yeah, Mom, I can't get through. Where are you? In a quiet, scary voice, Dad asked, at the Institute. I'm going home. We'll find a mom and get together. Come to our place. I have something to tell you. When the children heard about the accident, the daughter's eyes widened with horror and instantly filled with tears. She'll live. Barely audible, the girl whispered. I can't say for sure, but we have to believe it. The doctors did everything they could. Her condition is stable, but she's not conscious. Now she has to want to come back to us. That's the only way her body will fight back. And he dialed the clinic again. How's the Catalan doing? William Peterson. She's still unconscious. They answered him on the other end of the line. In our case, we should be glad. At least her condition isn't getting worse, said William, disconnecting the phone. But trust, of course, we'll be better off. The medical staff watched Kelly Makarova closely until the morning, but she never moved. Her breathing was shallow and infrequent, and her pulse was weak but steady. Consciousness never returned, and William Peterson began to fear the worst of the coma. By evening, he was back in the clinic and ready to start work. After the second operation came to an end, Corver went straight to the intensive care unit. But the nurse could do nothing to cheer him up. Unfortunately, there was no improvement, but no deterioration either, she said. She hated that William was moving away from the operating table like a man possessed. He walked into the resident's room. Couldn't be alone and the best among men. Let me make you some coffee, the nurse offered, and the man nodded silently. Maria's daughter had put something in his bag that morning. As it turned out, it was sandwiches and two apples. He had no appetite, but he ate, realizing that he needed strength to work. Unable to find a place to sit, he went to the emergency room again. For a while, the man stood near his wife's bed, not allowing a close look with the device, and then lifted the eyelid of the right eye. But it was unchanged. Then he put a chair beside the bed, sat down and took her dainty hand in his big soft palm and said, To be honest, Kelly, I don't remember how long ago I told you how much I love you. Yes, I do. And I also couldn't do it without you. You should come back, stop sleeping, but you're not a sleeping princess, you're an energetic creative person. I need you, me and the kids need you. We miss you very much. Maria, without you, is hitting the sweet spot again. And only you can stop her. He ran his thumb along the inside of her palm. The hand warmed, as if life was being rekindled in it. But Kelly didn't react in any way to his touch. She just doesn't want to come back here, William thought, to the place where she'd been hurt. Dr. Corver should know about such things. In order to escape from pain and suffering, victims go so deeply into themselves that it can be difficult or impossible to come back. Three more long days passed. William Peterson settled into the clinic. He could no longer tell if it was day or night. He spent all his time either in the operating room or in the intensive care unit. And now he was sitting across from her again, gazing into that dear, once beautiful face. But now she's not vital. Kissing her hands and talking, talking, talking about everything. William was just about to be, despairing and suddenly felt her hand move. Not much, just a little bit, but it moved. So she can hear him even though her eyes are still closed. Big girl, honey, it's me, Will, can you hear me? If you burned my finger. And oh my goodness, she squeezed. Oh, 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 not so hard, my dear, you'll break it once. He laughed. I adore you, my love. I await your return. Try to open your eyes. I know you want to see me too. Oh, I tried to lift her eyelids, but it didn't work right away because she had to return to this world as her husband asked her to. The pain immediately pierced her, and she wanted to go back to where it was quiet and nothing hurt. William Peterson realized that it hurt too much to comply with his request. Nina quickly anesthetized the painkiller. I'm on my way. William Peterson. After the medicine took effect, she opened her eyes and saw this strong man crying. I'm glad you're back with me. You're a fighter. I've always known that. Everything's gonna be okay now. I promise. William was always not only the soul of the company, but also in the family. 
He was the center of the universe. He could always make you laugh, encourage you, give you hope. For this he was loved, respected and trusted not only by his colleagues, but also by his wife and children. Children. How do they quietly ask Kelly? They're worried, they want to see you. I want to see them too. Later later my dear, they will surely come. And the car is pretty wrecked. Yeah, forget about that piece of iron. The main thing is that you're alive and you'll be well soon. I'm sleepy. Sure, go to sleep dear. I'll come back later. And when he walked into the resident's room with a smile at all 32, everyone present realized what had happened. She's back with us. Thank you. And he shook his hand wider than that. A few more times he looked in on his wife, but she was asleep. It was only toward evening that Kelly opened her eyes again. Hi, he said. I'm glad you're back with me. She made an attempt to smile back at him, but immediately grimaced in pain. How do you feel the same? He asked, realizing it was a very stupid question. She wanted to nod, but looked up again in pain. Head. You have a severe concussion and a small hematoma on the right side. He could see the anguish in her eyes. I understand, Kelly, you are in a lot of pain, said the husband sympathetically. They're going to give you some painkillers and you'll feel better. He stood up, walked over to the nurse and said half the usual dose. Let him stay awake longer. The nurse nodded and went to the patient. In the evening, William Peterson went home. He had a check on the children, even though they were adults, but still the children were more already asleep, and he kissed her hand. I'll be back in the morning, sweetheart. Kelly, I heard his words, but to open my eyes was no longer strong. It was hard to escape the morphing. And in the morning, when she woke up, she was surprised to find that her husband was beside her and smiling, looking at her with loving eyes. Good morning. Oh, darling. Hello. He understood her lips rather than heard them. You look much better today, he said. The woman didn't know what was wrong with her face. And William had no idea how to let me know about it. By the way, the kids are coming to visit you tomorrow. William changed the subject. They'd had a long, hard conversation yesterday. The man explained that mom still has to endure several plastic surgeries, that her face is disfigured. But you must not give the impression you are future doctors. You know that the patient in any case should be supported, gives you hope. It's clear, don't worry, everything will be fine. They endured, and the father was proud of his children. But once Maria got outside the hospital, she got really hysterical. Did you see that? She screamed. Yes, I'm even afraid to imagine mom's condition when she sees herself in the mirror. Calmed his sister down as best he could. A month passed. The hematoma dissolved. Her head also ached. The cast on her arm was removed. The wound on her leg was gradually healing, but her face. It was the first time she realized there was something wrong with it. When her hands were free to touch her cheek, she looked at her husband in horror. What's wrong with my face? Hearing this question, William Peterson grimaced as if in great pain. Kelly started. It was he to choose the right words, but the woman interrupted him. The mirror, she commanded. I don't have one. Then bring it, bring it to me. A mirror now, shouted the woman. Honey, you're not alone here. This is a hospital, not a beauty parlor. You got it. I'm sorry, she came to her senses a little and realized she'd overdone it. William didn't stop by until just before she went home. I gotta go. I'll be on the second shift tomorrow. I'll be there at three o'clock for tea. And he turned for the door, not even a goodbye kiss. He came back and was already bending down to kiss her when he heard her. Don't be. I know perfectly well you're disgusted. What's this nonsense? I'll try to sleep at night. And this can all be fixed. I'd like to remind you that a lot of people aren't as lucky as you. And now they're living in a cemetery forever. And you're throwing a tantrum because of your looks. Good night, darling. And he left the room. But I apologized. She shouted after her husband but still felt as if someone's invisible cold hand had squeezed her heart. She couldn't sleep for a long time, thinking about her husband, about the plastic surgery. Now she was ashamed of her behavior. It was essentially not her spouse's fault. William seemed an endless period that it took Kelly to finally come to her senses. It became especially hard morally when she was transferred from the intensive care unit to the ward. 
She lay in a separate room and refused to go out into the corridor, so as the woman put it, not to frighten the patients with her appearance. Recently she saw herself in the mirror and it was a real shock. And now it was discharge day. The doctor informed her that all the procedures were finished and Kelly could go home. She still limped a little, but it was a matter of time. The only thing Kelly was concerned about at the moment was plastic surgery. She knew several plastic surgeons already, and she had even written down the contacts of one of them. A friend had recommended it, arguing that everyone who went to him was very satisfied with the result. Kelly, you should have seen him, Betty said, rolling her eyes dreamily. I've never seen such a handsome man before. I mean, Alain Delon's a bit of a dud. But I don't think men should be so handsome. Maybe that's why he's in her memory when she gets home, and she'll contact him if he agrees. Wouldn't hesitate to go for counseling. After lunch William came to pick her up, helped her pack her things, put her in a chair and took her to her car. At home her children were waiting for her at the festive table, and she wanted to lie down, but she could not offend her favorite children. After all, she understood how hard they tried. Lunch smoothly passed into dinner, and she, modestly saying that she was tired, went to the shower, after which she felt human. Later, William entered the bedroom. Kelly, if you want, I can sleep in the other room for now. Why? No, I miss you. Go back to your seat. He put out the light and put Yurka under the covers. That's better. Or he'll lie down in the other room, she won't be so scared. And in general, be patient, do the operation. Yes, I love you in every way. But I see how important it is to you, and I'm not talking you out of it. Don't save money on doctors. Pick the best one. Thanks, Vitrenko. She lay on his chest and immediately fell asleep. And when she woke up, there was no one home. The first thing she did was to call almost Alain Delon, but actually Simmons Ethan. But she could only talk to his secretary because, as the latter put it, Mr. Simmons was very busy and needed not only her. How can you get me an appointment for counseling? Would he refuse to work with me? Kelly wondered. Why would he refuse? The secretary didn't understand. But my case is very complicated. Well, just so you know for Ethan. There are no complicated cases. He's the best. I know, that's why I want to discuss it with him. Consult in a week and discuss. Okay, let's make it a week from now. What time is 11 o'clock okay? Yes, thank you, I will. A week before the consultation, I knew all about Simmons Kelly plastic surgery and the truth. Handsome, excellent specialist. But here's what really surprised her. He's single. Why would women overlook such a specimen? Kelly pondered. Very interesting. And on the appointed day at exactly 11 o'clock, Simmons took her to tell about the reasons that led to this appearance. Kelly waited for his verdict. The doctor examined every inch of her face long and meticulously. But even after such a close examination, he did not jump to conclusions. He looked through a magnifying glass for a long time, scrutinized every orb. Then he took a photograph and set the date of the operation in a month. Before that to take all the tests. Tell me honestly, Ethan, how much chance do I have of regaining my former beauty? I'll do everything I can. And he took another hard look at her face. They said goodbye to the doctor, she walked out in the hallway, her phone rang. Looking at the screen, the woman smiled. It was William. I just came out of the plastic surgeon's office. Surgery after a month, he promised to return everything back to the way it was. I'm very happy for you, dear, for she was the only one who was silent for a second. It's very expensive. We can pay for it. Don't even think about it. The money is my concern. And Kelly immediately calmed down. At home, Kelly surfed the internet every night looking for information about the Simmons. But all the reviews were positive probably somewhere in the back of her mind, she wished she could find something not so enthusiastic about the man. But it was all to no avail. Women all as one described what a professional he was in his work, and how after the operation their self-esteem returned to them. And one evening, while Kelly was lost at her laptop, her husband's voice echoed behind her. Who's that handsome guy you're scrutinizing? It's not handsome, it's my plastic surgeon. In an even tone, she replied. I'm just familiarizing myself with his work. And do you know what conclusion I came to? 
the husband looked at Kelly expectantly. If it's not Photoshop, then he really is a magician, does incredible things. And I really want to be on his operating table. But he doesn't like my test results. Well, I think you'll make it. William smiled, kissing his wife on the top of her head. The doctor knows what he's doing. I always respect a serious approach. Any self-respecting doctor would value two things, patience and reputation. And the next day, Kelly was contacted by Simmons' secretary and asked her to come in for a consult with the doctor. The repeat test results came back. The cab pulled up to the clinic at 9 o'clock and she saw Ethan closing his car. It was the first time Kelly had seen him not in a row, but in a perfectly fitting suit. The gray-colored shirt and tie that had always been an important accessory to a man's toilet caught her eye. Tied in a knot, working as a fashion designer, she'd been interested in that in her day, and hugging himself to the cab she was getting out of, he gave her a hand. Good morning, he said, and graciously let her pass in front. Kelly appreciated the morning Ethan. She could smell the light and very pleasant scent of his toilet water. It was a scent that had mesmerized her even last time. Now it had become very familiar to her, as if it had accompanied her since long ago. She didn't stay long in the hallway. Come in, Kelly. He had already changed into his usual snow-white robe, under which he wore the same snow-white t-shirt. He kept peering at her from head to toe and noted to himself that the woman was quite interesting. I have good news for you. The repeat tests are normal, and we can set a date for the surgery. But there's less good news. The surgery isn't for another two months. I'm embarrassed to admit it, but I'm a little behind schedule. He saw her distress and rushed to reassure her. Don't feel bad, Kelly. Deadlines are relative. Two months is if you stick to the schedule. But there are always force major circumstances and patients ask to reschedule. In which case, I can do your surgery sooner. Just be ready at a moment's notice. The man really wanted to cheer up this beautiful woman, so he suggested. Maybe for a cup of coffee, there's a lovely cafe nearby. Aren't you in a hurry for another surgery? Kelly wondered. No. The last day of the month is report day. No surgeries are scheduled on those days. But let's go. But Kelly shook her head no. You don't go out in public with a face like mine. You just spoil people's appetites. And to be perfectly frank, when I hear you say something like that, I feel like you're mocking me. Not at all, Kelly. Well, then it gets a lot worse. Goodbye. I'll look forward to hearing from your secretary. And she quickly left the office. Two months, the woman pondered on her way out. That's an eternity. Maybe she should consider other doctors with less busy schedules. So once home, she started looking for other clinics. She liked two more. And the very next morning, she went to one of them. The doctor welcomed her warmly, examined her face at once and offered to do the surgery the day after tomorrow. But do I have time to take all the necessary tests? Asked a stunned woman. Are you not feeling well? Surprised the doctor. No, but then I see no reason for a thorough examination. Let's do a blood test for inflammation. Thank God we have our own lab. So we'll have the results in a couple hours, that's all. So do we have a contract? Kelly didn't say anything. Her inner voice told her that wasn't an option. The doctor's examination was not as thorough as Simmons. Didn't order any tests. And the surgery the day after tomorrow, it's all too soon. As William would say, not a serious approach. You know, I decided to consult my husband again. She replied after a short thought. Good, the doctor agreed. Already with less enthusiasm. Next clinic. Kelly decided not to go. No way, she said to herself. I'll wait. It's better that way. A week later, Simon got a call from the clinic. Kelly doctor, I'd like to see you. Can you come down here, please? A couple hours later, she was at the office. Come in, Kelly. I can tell you something. The patient who was supposed to be in surgery the day before yesterday has unfortunately fallen ill. That's basically what I called the circumstances. He said something else, and she thought she was glad to be with this man. Ethan Simmons' great company, especially when there's good news. Kelly, are you listening to me? Ah, uh, yeah, yeah, sure. The surgery's the day after tomorrow. I honestly couldn't hear the rest. And then I'm gonna invite you back for coffee. Let's go and sit in an outdoor cafe 
where it's less crowded and nature distracts from the attention to the customers. Well, okay, she put on again huge black glasses, lowered her bangs, tacks, and said I'm ready. Into his huge car she got in quickly so no one would see her. The car smelled of leather and toilet water. Passersby and stores flashed outside the windows. She didn't even ask where he was taking her. It didn't matter to her now. They sped through the air while obeying the rules of the road. Once on the highway, the car picked up speed, but quickly came to a stop, reaching a scenic area. I don't know why, Simmons muttered as he helped Kelly out of the car. But this little cafe makes mind-blowing coffee. It's worth the drive so far out of town. They left the cars on the curb and took the outermost table. And Kelly sat with her back to all the customers, even though there were only two, a couple in love who didn't need anyone but themselves. Are you comfortable? Yes, very nice and relaxed. I just have to make sure. Is the coffee really that good? You bet. The coffee was indeed excellent, and they drank two cups each. Then a brownie, which Kelly couldn't refuse. And then the conversation, which dragged on and there was no desire to rush anywhere, only to listen. They felt they were becoming more than doctor and patient to each other. It was both joyful and frightening at the same time. Will and the children were waiting for her at home. And the next day at 9 o'clock in the morning William Peterson drove his wife. Cosmetology went to the clinic. I myself want to look at the doctor in whose hands I give my treasure, smiling, said William. He did not go into details that he made inquiries about this clinic. The reviews about Simmons were indeed good, but he wanted to have a look at the clinic itself. Inside everything was respectable. The secretary is a pretty girl in a short robe. Everything was as it should be. Ethan walked towards them. Good morning, Kelly. Morning. I'd like you to meet my husband, William Corver, your colleagues. He's a top-notch surgeon. Simmons extended his hand. Pleased to meet you, William nodded, noting the handshake. Why did his heart sound like that? What could have alerted him to this man? The man didn't understand. Kelly calm. What about him? Thank you, Will. I'll take it from here. If possible, William turned to Simon. It's better to use a local anesthetic. She's been under a general recently after major surgery, and her heart is not a fiery engine. I'll take it under advisement, Ethan replied. How can you do that? Give me a call. William asked and kissed her. Ethan watched the whole thing. He loves you. He said softly as the door closed behind him. I love him too. He's a wonderful man. And as I said, a surgeon by God. Okay, Kelly will show you to your room now. Surgery is scheduled for 11 o'clock. I already told you, we're not going to get everything done today. It's too big a lesion. So don't expect me to take the bandages off in a couple hours and you'll go to your surgeon. Just be patient. Okay, I got it. At exactly 11 o'clock, they came to pick her up and escort her to the operating room. It was a small, clean, and bright room with all sorts of equipment and instruments. Dr. Simmons was already there. Help the patient to lie down on this table, he asked the nurse. And when she lay down, wearing a mask, I'll check. Ready. I think so, the woman replied, and he nodded to the anesthesiologist. The local anesthetic was slowly starting to take effect, and Kelly stopped feeling her body. From the shoulder up, she couldn't feel her head as if it didn't even exist. The bright shadowy lights of the operating room were shining directly into her eyes. The doctor bent over her so low that she could see the color of his eyes and his smoothly shaven and shaven face. His eyes looked confident and she felt at ease. Everything was going well. Talking to her, he spoke to her. Don't worry, everything will be fine. Just be patient a little longer. I think that's enough for today. Talking to her, he did not stop his work for a moment. His hands were plowing in front of his eyes, and she was interested in watching him. The operation lasted three hours. Sleep on your back. Everybody rest. And she was wheeled to her room. And he sat up again. It was more work than Ethan had anticipated. But this was an unusual case. It's not just chin or eyelids. There really was jewelry work here. The next morning he visited Kelly in her room. How are you feeling? Sleepy. Then get some rest. When's the next surgery? Ah, but the plan is five days from now. But it depends on how you feel. 
He left the room and she was asleep. William called in the evening and they had a little chat about her well-being and the children. Five days later, Ethan began the next phase. Kelly wasn't nervous this time because she knew what was going to happen. The feeling was familiar, and she looked up at him and saw his smiling eyes. I see you're not scared at all. That's wonderful. You've survived one day in particular. Today is the second. You probably don't know why these days are special, do you? Well, I'll tell you because together we've taken a step toward a new face without scars and terrible cuts. She saw his eyes smile and covered her own. When she opened them, she was already lying in the room. Touching her hands gingerly, bandages. Sank back into sleep. And in the morning, Simmons visited her again. How are you doing? Kelly's face was mined, but her eyes, looking through the snaps of the bandages, smiled. And she gave him a thumbs up. He smiled back. Be quicker this time. We'll continue until the day after tomorrow you'll rest and then we'll make you beautiful. And this is for you my employee put in the vase brought red rose for your excellent behavior in the operating room. One small step at a time. And William was inching closer to the day that would become Kelly's third birthday. As soon as he arrived at the clinic, the first thing he did after putting on his gown was to rush to his patient's room. Like a magician pulling a flower out of his sleeve and giving it to her, he didn't like her very much today. She seemed a little sluggish. How are you feeling? The doctor asked. Yesterday I was fine, but at night. And at night I felt cold. I think I had a fever. Did you inform the nurse about it? No, she hadn't gotten to me yet. I had a fever, but a slight one. This infection scared Kelly. I don't think so. But it's worth monitoring. She was wheeled into the oar in a wheelchair. All the stitches were clean. There was no inflammation at the surgical site. And Simmons breathed a sigh of relief. Are you in any pain? He asked. No, nothing. Just a slight fever. Let's wait and see. I'll stay at the clinic today to make you feel better. Or maybe you should call your husband. Kelly offered shyly. Don't you trust me? Well, if I didn't, I probably wouldn't be lying here. Well, that's great. I think you're overly stressed. Stress can also cause a fever. So he asked the nurse to take the patient to her room when he came in after lunch. She was asleep. Ethan sat up for a while beside her. Her breathing was even. He touched her hands. They were warm. He had a circumferential facelift surgery today. He had to get ready, and he so hated to leave her. But work came first. It had taken him 45 years of his life, since birth, to become Ethan Simmons, a man admired by women and envied by other surgeons. But men admired him too. It was worth getting to know him. He had many friends among women and men. If he was an enemy to anyone, it was a ruthless one. Because circumstances forced him to be so. But even those who envied and hated him could not deny him respect for his golden hands. He was a strong man, ready to fight to the end for what he believed in, and never abandoned his friends. His character was complex, and not everyone could stand him. That's probably why he reached such heights. Ethan's appearance was as impeccable as his reputation as a plastic surgeon. Tall, slender, gorgeous black hair and with blue eyes that could radiate love and steel, depending on the circumstances. A slight unpleasantness conveyed his appearance and already sexy look. Unmarried. He was only because no woman could stand his work rhythm and the presence of so many beautiful ladies at work. To achieve what he had now, he had had to work hard and sacrifice his family. Kelly was therefore understandable. She looked like so many other women at Simmons with adoration. For today, he almost doubted himself. The temperature of his favorite patient confused him. The man was already ready for surgery when a nurse helped him lie down on the operating table. Another patient. An hour and a half later, he returned to Kelly. She had just opened her eyes. How are you feeling now? I think better, she answered in a slightly hoarse voice. He was on his way out of the room when Oli's phone rang. Will, hello. Hello, my love. How are you doing? Yeah, it's going slow. Don't worry, guys. We're fine. Can I visit you? Honey, I miss you. No, Will, I'm in a state where there's nothing to see. I'll meet you at home. All right, what do you say? She thought he was offended, 
but she still felt very bad, so she didn't want to upset him. In the evening, Simmons visited her again. He never went home and took her temperature, which was almost normal. They talked for a long time, both marveling at how pleasant each other's company was to them. They turned out to be very different, but it was all the more interesting to talk. He left her around midnight. Good night, the doctor said. I'll come and see you in the morning before I leave. I'll be waiting, she replied and fell asleep with a smile on her lips. And when he came in in the morning, she was very surprised. Are you without a flower today? She asked. I see you're in a good mood. Yes, without a flower. Tomorrow there will be a bouquet for that. Let's change the temperature. I already measured it, it's normal. But to be honest, you scared me, Kelly. I thought I'd become a lousy surgeon. You call yourself a compliment. Well, a word of endearment goes a long way with a cat. No, I'm sorry, the cat. You're an excellent surgeon, Ethan. That's why I'm here. Uh, thank you. You put me at ease. And he leaned over and kissed her hand. Today was Kelly Makarova's last surgery. She's been tired for the past two months. The woman had undergone five surgeries, short and long, but each one brought her closer to her new appearance. She didn't see herself in the mirror and only believed the doctor's words. Everything is going beautifully. I am satisfied, he told Kelly. One day William himself called Simmons and, introducing himself, asked permission to visit his wife. I won't be long, I promise. I've only heard her voice for a month and a half. Do you miss her? And there was a note of jealousy in his question. Is it allowed or not? William inquired, letting it pass his ears. Not exactly the doctor's correct question. Of course, come in, I'll leave a pass for you. The nurse kindly escorted him to Kelly's room. Hello, darling. William, how did you get in here? My pass. How are you? It's all tied up for now. But the doctor says it's going well and he's pleased with the result. But the important thing is that it's pretty. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. You don't know how much I want to go home. Why not? I do very well. We all miss you. I miss you too. He completely forgot about the flowers he brought her, put out fruit, her favorite chocolate. How's work going for you? What, maybe I have a new one, saving people every day, every hour. Sometimes I get the impression that people don't like themselves at all and don't value their health. How many people end up in the clinic because of their own stupidity? It's amazing. All this time he held her hand and stroked her palm with his thumb. She thought he had more gray hair and looked a little tired. Are you from home? No, I'm after night duty and two night surgeries. I've noticed that I'm not pretty. No, you're always handsome, even after night duty. He kissed her hand. When the doctor gives you a prescription, he says first I said we'd take the bandages off, and then we'd see what happened. William would have loved to sit and talk to her some more, but he promised not for long. I'm going to go. Kelly will call you tonight. Love you. Thanks for stopping by. It was good to see you. He put the bouquet in a vase where a white rose was already standing. The husband didn't ask where it came from. He didn't want to embarrass his wife, and he was pleased to realize that his wife liked other men but no more than that. And in the evening, William called to say good night. Simmons came later and they talked again until midnight. We'll be saying goodbye soon, but you can always call me. If anything goes wrong. Well, if you count on that, I'll never call you, Kelly smiled. Thank you. It's my pleasure. Can I just call you for a chat? It's a deal. A week later, she was invited to the dressing rooms. Have a seat, Kelly. We're going to remove the bandages. When all the bandages had been thrown in the hamper, he scrutinized every inch of her face. Like a sculptor forming new contours. You know, I'm very pleased with my work. It couldn't have been done better. Quickly hand me the mirror. Kelly's voice was clearly impatient. Kelly, I warn you, the face is still in the revitalization stage. There's some swelling and some beauty, but it will pass with time. A lot of work has been done, you just have to be patient for a little while longer. At your follow-up appointment in two weeks, you'll have your stitches removed. They'll be visible for a while too. But again, it's only temporary. Trust me, you heard me. Yes, hesitantly, she said. Only then did he hand her the mirror. When she saw her face, she looked at him and tears flowed. 
I don't know what you are satisfied with seeing this nightmare. But there's nothing left for me to do. How can I believe you again? The tears rolled like peas. And she couldn't even contain herself. When can I go home? Well, we'll observe you for a week. She interrupted him. Three days, I'm gone. He didn't want to break up with her, but he realized that he wouldn't be able to keep her for the rest of his life anyway. So he said okay. All three days she lay facing the wall. And when he came in, he talked to her back. After three days the swelling had gone down considerably, which made Kelly very happy. But the beauty still held. The night before she called her husband to tell him she was being discharged. Can you pick me up? Just not first thing in the morning. Twelve o'clock would be fine. No, I want to leave early. Okay, I'll call a cab. I'll meet you at home. In the morning she packed her bag, checked all the drawers to make sure she hadn't forgotten anything and headed for Simmons' office. Ethan, I called a cab. I'm leaving for home in 15 minutes. Okay, hold on. It won't be long before the discharge papers are ready. He handed her a document. I wish you a healthy Kelly. And don't ever come back to us again. Thank you for everything you've done for me. The woman didn't expect him to hug her and she sighed again. The same delicious perfume enveloping her in his car. Give me your bag. I'll walk you to the cab. When they left the clinic, the car was already waiting for her. Opening the door, he helped her in and waved her in, but happy. It was the last day of the month. He had paperwork to do, as usual, and there was a lot of work piling up, but he didn't feel like doing anything. I've gone home, he told the nurse. We have two surgeries tomorrow. Okay, Ethan. The man drove home in a terrible mood. He missed her already and berated himself for not giving her a ride home himself. When Kelly got home, there was a return apartment waiting for her, dinner prepared. Both kids hadn't gone to the institute, getting ready to see their mom. She was happy to see them, cradling them in her arms. They became quite grown up, but most importantly the children were healthy. Why did God send me such happiness? Looking at them, Kelly said. Lunch turned into dinner and the family gathered around the table and couldn't get enough of talking. William was happy to see the whole family together. No one was paying attention to Kelly's face, and she had forgotten what it had been like to see her own reflection in the mirror. The children scattered to their rooms, and William talked and talked to Kelly about everything. When the house was quiet, she sat at the table and enjoyed the comforts of home. And in the morning it was getting late. William closed the windows with curtains to keep the sunlight out of his eyes. Thus, he hoped to prolong his wife's sleep, but alas, the day was coming with the noise of cars, sunlight, and the voices of the boys in the kitchen. A little lower. In bed, she got up without putting on her robe, and Kelly wandered around the apartment in her nightgown, enjoying the freedom. Taking a mirror in hand, the woman, carefully impersonating a doctor, examined her face. The swelling was almost gone. There was only a little bit left to beauty. Of course, a great transformation was visible. Now it was even scary to remember what had happened to her face. She was knocking back her coffee when the phone rang. Looking at the display, she saw that it was Betty. But how are you doing? Are you beautiful already? Or did the doctor's office not live up to expectations? Hello, Betty. No, the doctor is wonderful. Everyone loves him and I'm one of them now. He's very competent, and I believe every word he says. I feel great. Thank you for the advice to go to him. And what kind of handsome man did you appreciate? Yeah, he's an interesting man. I can't argue with that. But your will is just as good. So you're the envy of the world. I guess you're right about that when you're supposed to shoot in two weeks. Great, so we'll set up a meeting later. Everyone can't wait to see you refreshed. I agree. I miss you guys too. Two weeks went by fast. Kelly rested, regained her strength and waited for a call from the clinic. Hello Kelly, this is the Simmons Clinic. It would be convenient for you to arrive at 2 o'clock tomorrow afternoon. Why not in the morning? Ethan has a surgery and then he'll take care of you. Uh, okay, I'll be there. Simmons purposely rescheduled the surgery for the morning so he could take care of Kelly and then take her out to a coffee shop or restaurant to celebrate the successful completion of the surgery. He tried to dial her phone number 14 times in 14 days and then put it off. Speaking of himself, 
he said he could not interfere in a family where the husband loved his wife so much. It was visible to the naked eye, but he was drawn to her like a magnet, helped by work, and he forgot for a while. Tonight he would finally see her. At exactly 200 hours, she knocked on his office door. May I? Yeah, yeah, come on in Kelly. How are you feeling? Ah, fine. Let's go to the oar while he put on his gown, mask, gloves. The nurse helped Kelly change and lay on the table. Everything was already familiar the light of his face quite close and the lights in his blue hair. There was going to be a little complaining. A little unpleasant, bear with me. There will be a feeling of skin tightness afterward. The slight discomfort will pass quickly and you will be a beauty in a month. All this he told her without stopping working for a moment. When he was done, the nurse nodded and she did her part. You can all get up now, he said to Kelly. The nurse helped and walked out of the operating room. Kelly, do you have any urgent matters to attend to? Asked the doctor without looking at her. No, I'm completely free. Then let me invite you to celebrate the end of our collaboration. I agree, Kelly replied immediately. Feel free to go to the restaurant. And you won't be embarrassed with me, she smiled. Of course not. Well, then I'm not ashamed either. At the restaurant, they took the farthest table. Kelly, you look so beautiful, and that suit looks great on you. Thank you. Offering her hair, the woman replied. It was lunchtime, so it was time to eat. What can I get you? He asked. I want a lot of vegetables too. That's fine. Then I'll have the veal with vegetables too. You can have some wine if you like. I'd support you too, but I'm driving. All right then, red dry. I'm flying to London on Monday, Kelly. I'm going to a conference for plastic surgeons. There's always a lot of interesting stuff there. I took pictures of you and two of my other patients. I'll be bragging. Let me know how it goes. Do you really, really wonder? Ethan looked at her in surprise. Of course I'm curious if they like my picture. Ethan laughed. I can tell you right now that they'll like it. Glancing at her watch, she exclaimed to Ethan, I have to go. Okay, I'll give you a ride. He showed the waiter. He paid for his lunch and pushing Kelly's chair away from the table, helped her up. He took the longest way to her house. Well, here we are, she said with regret in her voice. Thank you again for bringing me back to life. Simmons opened the car door and helped her out and said goodbye. She looked after his car and waved. A month and a half later, they met at a conference of surgeons, but already in Russia. There was a plenary session, and then the surgeons went to their sections. They bumped into each other at the entrance to the hall. Hello, Kelly. And he shook hands with Vitaly Peterson. How are you feeling? Fine. But I'll be fine soon. And you're interested in surgery now? Yes, I often accompany my husband to such events. That's commendable. And he let her go on ahead into the room. The Orlovsky spouses sat somewhere in the middle of the hall, and Ethan had a short speech at the plenary session and a large, detailed one at the plastic surgeon's section. He had to talk about a trip to England. A month later, Kelly went to work. All the sick leave at her own expense was over. She missed her favorite job and the people she had spent nine years of her life with. Kelly was a good fashion designer. Her success as a fashion designer was determined by her personal qualities. She wasn't afraid to say I don't know, and she loved to learn. Her innate artistic taste, imagination and flexibility of thought helped her in sketching. She was an innovator. She listened attentively to fashion trends. She was fond of new technologies. The woman did not like to work with ready-made sketches, which were created by designers. She did everything herself. In her models you could feel the hand of a professional. I adore her chosen field and every time she looked forward to the upcoming fashion show, she could already see their models being sold out in the stores. Whatever she did at work, she loved it. She was passionate about her work. But when she looked at herself in the mirror, she remembered her doctor, and her heart began to beat in a purified rhythm. Kelly considered herself a happy mother and a loving wife, was perfectly content with life and her marriage of almost 20 years. Those years, from the moment she married Vitelli, flew by like a blink of an eye. Very quickly, they became weather parents. Therefore, for six years, the young mother was engaged with the children and the house, and it suited her quite well. Household chores never seemed burdensome to her. 
she was never annoyed by the need to drive and transport her children from daycare. Now that the children were grown, she could do the things she loved to do. But it bothered her to think about Dr. Simmons too often. He missed her dearly too. He would go to model shows and see her there, always passing the bouquet through someone, but never leaving a note. Yeah, he didn't need one. Kelly knew who the gift was from. Started looking for him with her eyes, but she couldn't find him. She tried to call him a few times, but something stopped her. They met again at the fundraiser and ran into each other in the checkroom. Good evening, Simmons said. Didn't you and I often find ourselves looking at Ethan, then Kelly? William inquired. I prefer to do it more often, Ethan replied. He tilted his head slightly. Kelly watched them from the side. He was tall, slender, each handsome in their own way and both excellent surgeons. Will, what are you doing? Doesn't he have a right to be at this party? Who do you think you are? No, he's just not looking at you like a doctor. Well, that's right. He's not my doctor anymore. Don't be ridiculous. You're hurting my feelings. Ethan tried to keep out of the guy's sight, but as fate would have it, they kept running into each other at meetings and conferences. It was like she was testing them on purpose, making their hearts beat faster and blood rush at a frightening rate. They'd almost bumped heads once in a restaurant. Ethan glanced over at Kelly and with a nod, made his way to the table where a lady was waiting for him. Why did Kelly's mood immediately sour? Why did she find the woman so unworthy? Ethan. Asking herself these questions, she didn't even try to answer them. And so a year passed. The Simmons Clinic flourished. He was even forced to take on an assistant to a promising young surgeon. At once it became easier, and he wished he had done it sooner. For the spring model show, he showed up with the same lady. He was afraid that if he was alone, he wouldn't stand for it and would approach Kelly. But he realized he had no right to do that. And she looked backstage and searched for him with her eyes. And finally, she found him. He was sitting directly across from the model's exit, and Kelly saw the same lady next to him. No sooner had she pouted her lips than a bouquet was brought to her. Again without a note, but again she didn't need one. The woman already knew everything. She quickly grabbed her phone before she changed her mind and dialed a single word. Thank you. She watched him from backstage. He opened the message, smiled, and hid the phone. But the smile, she thought, was sad. It had been a year and a half since the surgery. Looking at her face, she thought it had always been like that. That morning, she was getting ready for work and putting on light makeup. It was quiet. The kids were getting ready for the institute, and Maria Mom's sudden shout of where's my wallet made Kelly startled. Her hand trembled, and she scratched a piece of skin on her face with her fingernail. Clamping the wound with an alcohol-soaked cotton pad, she hailed a cab and drove to the clinic. Simmons they met in the hallway. Something was wrong. She put the disc away. She got the disc. I accidentally nicked it with my fingernail. And I don't think I'm worried. Now get dressed and let's go to the oar. I had to put in a neat little stitch. It's no big deal. It's uncomfortable, but it's not fatal. Don't worry. You'll have to wear a band-aid. Come back in two days. I'll take a look. You can get up now. You write the bill, I'll pay everything. He nodded and went into the office. When she came in after him, he turned sharply to her and said, I've missed you, Kelly, and I've wanted to see you all the time. I missed the look of your voice, the smell of you. He continued to say something, making her lose herself in reality. I can't do it without you. I've tried, but it doesn't work. I missed our conversations too. He wrapped his arms around her, and she didn't want to push him away. Ethan. It felt like if he broke the embrace now, he'd miss her forever. I've tried to stay away from you, but it's not working. I love you, Kelly, he whispered, looking into her beautiful eyes. I probably love you too. Even more quietly, the woman said, and he put all the tenderness and love he had for her into his kiss, and she responded with just as much desire. Now they were doing what they had forbidden themselves to do for a year and a half. Perhaps their time had come. It was a derangement of reason. Obsession, mad infatuation, obsession, passion. You could call it all sorts of things. But they didn't linger now. Nothing needed to be said, they felt everything. After a year and a half apart, Ethan and Kelly became lovers. Ethan, hi, 
I finally got you on the phone. How are you? Better now. Do you want me to fly up to you? I'd love to. I need someone to share it with, someone to talk to. I'm wandering around the house like a ghost. Aren't you working? No, I'm working now. Otherwise, I'd probably go crazy. Okay, I'll call you as soon as I get the tickets. I'll be really looking forward to seeing you. Thomas was a childhood friend. The one and only for life. At first, they had lived near each other, gone to the same kindergarten, then sat at the same desk at school and fought off the local bullies together. They went to college together. Although Thomas didn't really want to go to medical school, he decided to go with his friend. Six years at the institute brought the boys even closer together. His friend did not work as a doctor, but organized his own clinic, where excellent specialists worked. He turned out to be a great organizer and administrator. And the inheritance left by his parents helped in opening the clinic. He had to weigh a lot of things, think, plan, calculate what it will cost him this or that project, and whether the game is worth the candle. And so far, he hasn't been wrong. He had a gut feeling, which did not deceive him. True, the friends were now far apart. Ethan in New York, David in Toronto. But the distance did not prevent the friends from socializing and meeting more often at the earliest opportunity. Thomas was in New York on business. Ethan, having extensive acquaintances and connections, helped his friend to solve unsolvable problems. Thomas had a family, two beautiful daughters and a son. His wife worked at his clinic. There were no outbursts of jealousy because, unlike Ethan, Thomas dealt with paperwork and his wife didn't see it as a threat to her marriage. And Ethan was alone again. And at the thought of her, the man's heart clenched. Many women wanted to be near the successful man, but the place really belonged to Kelly alone. Of course, so did Thomas, but in another sense, he had no operations today. But Ethan got up at 700 him anyway, washed and cleaned up and called the clinic. Everything's in place, he asked. Are you ready for surgery? Yeah, we're good. Ethan is ready and everything is in place. Call me, if anything goes wrong. Okay, cell phone rings, it's a house. He bought it for her to live here, to breathe the forest air, to swim in the small, clean river in the summer. And now this house he hated. It was empty and cold without Oli in it. Ethan hadn't felt so happy in years. And never in his life had there been a woman like Kelly, beautiful, exciting. Simmons fell in love with her as soon as he saw her. And they didn't even know each other. She's a patient, a married woman with two grown children. He's a doctor, but once they talked, they both realized they were attracted to each other. Ethan admired her ability to look both sexy and elegant at the same time. He was pleased to realize that such an interesting woman was in love with him. Kelly, on the other hand, thought that everything that happened between them was a special atmosphere. The doctor saves the patient and gives her back her beautiful face. Kelly wanted to believe in what was happening between them. He she wanted to believe that everything that was happening, that what was going on between them was sincere. She had never had another man in her life other than her husband, and he was the only one she felt the most important relationship with. Competing with William was difficult. Even a very handsome, reliable, intelligent, and charming man. He loved his Kalinka as he had the first day they met. But Ethan had turned everything in her mind upside down. They had always been good together. This woman was to him the embodiment of everything a man could dream of in his life. Kelly was his fairy tale princess, not only beautiful, but also smart seductive. All in all, the best. They were crazy about each other. She gave Ethan that special state of mind that made him want to move mountains. They enjoyed each other's company. He had never imagined he would be so happy with just her presence. Ethan would never forget the time spent with her. In the evening, Thomas called again. I leave tomorrow at 8 p.m. I've got the number. Tell me I'll meet you. But it'll be at night. Yeah, I don't care, I don't sleep. I'd rather meet you. Okay, well, whatever you need me to do to get there myself. Now Ethan slept only before the operation taking sleeping pills to make him sleepy in the evening. Today, he was on his way to meet a friend. He was glad to see him. It was quite dark outside when he drove out of the house. It was still about 40 minutes until Thomas arrived, and he was excited to walk around the lounge. 
Looking at his watch, he heard the airplane. When he looked at his watch, he heard that the Toronto, New York plane had landed at the airport. Ethan hadn't seen Thomas yet, but he was already smiling. But it's taking a long time. Our friend didn't come out for a long time. Both Ethan and Ethan craned their necks, looking for him. You'll be looking for me for a long time. There was a familiar voice behind me. Ethan turned around, looking at you with all his eyes. Well, hello, friend. It's good to see you, and they hugged. I hope you didn't come for two days. Ethan asked hopefully, looking at Thomas. Two weeks. Great. It was said sincerely because Ethan understood how hard it was for his friend to get away, to leave his family and job, and devote two weeks to a friend. You look. You don't look good. Thomas concluded. Be thankful I'm still alive. And to be honest, I still don't believe that what happened to me was real. Talking, they quickly reached the house. This is quite a palace, Thomas said when he saw the mansion. It's not too big for you. It is bigger even for my family. I want to sell it and buy an apartment near the office so I can walk to work. That's a great idea. Mr. Plastic Surgeon. While Thomas showered, Ethan prepared a simple breakfast. Ethan made a simple breakfast, and they sat across from each other, drinking coffee and wrinkling their faces at the pleasant smell of the beverage. You go get some rest. I'll go to the clinic. Rest up, Thomas. It's a deal. His friend fell asleep as soon as his head hit the pillow. Ethan stopped by the clinic, where he hadn't been for two days. But things were going on as usual. Everyone was in place, and everyone was busy doing their own thing. It was literally half an hour. He drove back. On the way he bought good cognac, meat, cheese, caviar. And when he entered the house, there was silence. Thomas was still asleep. He took care of the meat. He battered it well, roasted it a little on both sides and put it in the oven. He made sandwiches, sliced sausage and cheese, turned on the TV quietly and waited for him to come down. About an hour later, Thomas came down a little backed up with bangs of black hair. It brought back memories of sleeping over at each other's houses as kids and getting up in the morning. Exactly the same way. Your place is so quiet, so peaceful. It's quiet in my house. Only at night, when everyone's quiet. That's beautiful, Thomas. Family's important. How long have you known that? I've always known it. The thing is, not all the women could compete with my work. They always thought I loved them less. What do you think? They were right. I guess I've got the meat ready. I'm not much of a cook, so I didn't try anything fancy. I just did the basics. But you're good. I can't even do that, grinned my friend. That's how we live. But you like it, don't you? Yes, but when I get tired, I have a place to run away for two weeks. It's harder for my wife. She doesn't have a friend like that. Ethan was smiling. It was like he was alive, and the house didn't seem blind to him anymore. They went into the dining room, and he put his arm around his friend's shoulders. It was a rather spacious room furnished with furniture in soft stock colors. On the walls hung paintings with appropriately themed reproductions. Looking at the paintings, Thomas asked. Ethan nodded. There was a large key of palm tree in the corner, and the dining room window overlooked the garden. But there were tempting aromas coming from the table, and the men felt hungry. And you know, you have a very cozy and clean place with someone helping you. The man nodded and pointed Thomas to the table. Ethan couldn't start a conversation about himself, and Thomas didn't rush him. They had been sitting for over an hour, sipping cognac. They took their time, reminiscing a lot. Ethan even laughed, something he hadn't done in four months. There was a deep crease between his eyebrows, and his hair was graying. He spoke suddenly, and Thomas prepared himself to listen. It was an important quality in a man. He never interrupted, but was patient and tried to see the situation from the outside. He avoided hasty judgmental assessments. This created a favorable atmosphere for conversation. Now I know for sure that fate does not like those who have everything. Ethan glanced over at Thomas. I realized this to the fullest extent when yesterday I was a successful businessman and the best surgeon, a full house and most importantly, a loving beloved woman. Turns out, what I used to think was love was a big mistake. Can you believe it? I only knew true love with her. With this incredible woman. Why didn't you marry her? Taking advantage of the pause, 
Thomas asked. 365 times a year, I asked her to be my wife. And 365 times, she gave me reasons to postpone it. The children are still in school. If I left, they might drop out. Then the kids had to get jobs. Then my daughter had her first love. Then my husband had a promotion. I had to support him. And so on for almost all six years. We dreamed with her about how we would live together, where we would spend our vacations. She tossed herself between her husband and me. It was easier for me. I'm a man. I'm free. She was married. A loving mother. I understood all that and was content to see her. Did your husband guess about your relationship? Ethan answered this question not immediately. There was such silence in the house that one could hear the huge floor clock ticking in Ethan's study. But a hurricane was raging in the man's soul. He was reliving the tragedy all over again. I think he guessed. He even came to my clinic. We had a very long talk. Quietly, calmly, and let Kelly decide for herself. But she didn't come to me right after our first explanation and our one kiss. She disappeared for two months. She didn't even come back for the shock. Then I found out that William had done it himself. I had no right to rush her, realizing how hard it was for her to decide. On one side of the scales of 20 years of married life, two children and a loving husband, and on the other, a love affair that flared up. Perhaps she was expecting that this love that flared up so quickly would extinguish even more quickly. But it didn't. And one day she came to me on her own. Can you imagine that day and hour I remembered for the rest of my life? To give his friend a break from the heavy memories, Thomas raised a shot glass. Ethan, let's drink to your happy future. It's impossible without her, he said, in a shaky voice. Anything is possible in life, and they drank. The bottle of cognac was long since empty, and both men were completely sober. The first time she called me if was when she burst into my apartment after two months away. If I can't be without you. She said it then. I've tried, but I can't do it. And she hugged me. At that moment, I was the happiest person in the world. She stayed with me until late afternoon and went home. I didn't want to let her go. You can't imagine. I loved everything about her. I adored her. I didn't even realize you could love each other so passionately. I could hardly concentrate on my work. I enjoyed giving her gifts. To fulfill her every whim, and she didn't want much. You know the song. There's a sweetheart around. That's the one. A year went by like that, but nothing changed. We used every minute to be together. We didn't know how to handle it. Kelly thought it would all work out in time, but time passed. The knot was getting tighter and tighter, and she couldn't find a solution. I loved her so much that I was ready to let her go when I saw her suffering. But she wouldn't even hear of it. I can't be without you, Ethan. I need you. So move in with me, and it'll be easier for everyone to put an end to this. That's when she started crying. I know, I know, she'd interrupt me, but you know. I, I can't do this right away, I have a life. Kelly, I mean right away, it's been almost two years. She'd start crying again, and I couldn't stand her tears, and I'd immediately apologize for pushing her. As he was saying this, he didn't notice the mountain of torn paper napkins that lay beside him. He was tearing them with fury. Thomas didn't touch him, realizing the man needed to vent his negativity, and all your dreams of living together remained a dream. He asked. Yes, they were. It didn't work out. We kept seeing each other every spare minute. I bought this house for her to be more outdoors, to relax, but she always thought about her children, who also arranged her scandals and expressed their discontent. And after another domestic scandal, she disappeared again for two months. I called her to see if everything was all right. Yes, she replied in her iron voice, I was fine. I remember that night I got drunker than ever. On principle, Alcohol is the anesthesia that allows you to undergo the operation called life. I didn't want to live, but I didn't make any claims against her, realizing she was having a harder time than I was. After a couple weeks, I started to let go, and I was working like crazy. It saved me a lot. I took on the most complicated surgeries at the time when I was so stressed, and I had a great result. I was surprised myself, but the patients were very satisfied. Their conversation was interrupted by a phone call. Ethan, you can come to the clinic right away. Something's happened. 
Yes, there's something wrong with a patient here. Okay, I'll be right there. He washed and cleaned up. Called a cab. Thomas, watch TV. Give me a break. I'll be right back. But Thomas decided to look around the house. It took him an hour. He went into Ethan's study. It was in perfect order. Only a few white sheets and a pen were out of order. They were poems. Even Thomas didn't know that Ethan's writing on poems was them again. As he read through the outline, he realized that he had truly loved this woman and had suffered a tragedy. Ethan came back a couple hours later. Did you get everything sorted out? Yeah, thank God they managed without me. Ethan, I'm sorry, but I've been reading your poems, and I love them. They convey your pain, the depth of the tragedy you've suffered. I didn't know you had a talent for it. It's true what they say. A talented man is talented at everything. But Ethan waved his hand and let's go and buy you some real Indian tea, given by a grateful husband. And they both laughed. For some time they were silently enjoying the aroma of the drink. Ethan suddenly asked his friend, Tell me, how can I go on living? Nothing pleases me. Not even my once favorite job. Ethan, everything passes. It will pass and this time heals. Your soul hurts. All you have to do is wait. So what happened next? Thomas asked. Two months later she came again. She looked awful. You don't feel well. I asked her. Yes, she replied. I don't feel well without you. Then stay. She nodded and stayed. In the morning we had breakfast and felt almost like a family. All the five plus years we'd been seeing each other whenever we had the chance. I think back now and wonder how we managed it. But I guess these things happen. I lived from her leaving to her returning to me and marveled that a year had passed. Then two, three, four. We were good together. But even then she found reasons to wait a little longer. I didn't consider those reasons to be reasons. It was more like an excuse not to change anything. I had given up all hope of seeing her around as a wife, but five years passed, and one day she came to me with a suitcase. When I opened the door to her, I stood like a stumbling block, and she threw the suitcase, hugged me, pressing her nose against my neck. And she was crying quietly. Why are you crying? For joy. Because I decided to take this step, and you're there for me. We talked all night. She told me that William quietly let her go, saying that the sacrifices she was trying to make to save her family were of no use to anyone. Everyone had figured it out a long time ago. But you know this, he told her. If you need my help, call me right away. So the point was finally made. And we started living together. She never filed for divorce. I was never meant to be her husband. I made her quit her job. She looked terrible. She couldn't sleep at night walked around the house like a ghost. But after two or three months, she calmed it down. She slept again, had an appetite. I hired a cook so she wouldn't cook, but rest. He cooked delicacies for her six months later. My beloved came to life, ran up to me. And that's when I decided it was happiness. She was a beacon for me, a guiding star, a light in the window. And I knew it would always be that way, no matter what happened. Eight months of happiness, taking a two-week vacation. She and I flew to Paris, spent unforgettable days in the city of love. She chose where to go, what to see. But I would have been happy even if we were in a hotel room. We went to the movies, walked around Paris, talked about everything that came to mind. And sometimes we would just sit next to each other and be silent. Feeling perfectly happy, we could talk about literature, painting fashion, theater, she was a versatile person, and I was surprised to find that she knew as much about painting as she did about fashion. We could talk about our parents, about childhood dreams and youthful desires, and the beginning of adulthood and careers. We were never bored. Women I knew, looking at us, would often say to me later, What do you see in her? She pales next to you. And I wondered how they couldn't see the beauty of this goddess. She was beautiful. She was absolutely made for me. And then I realized that any even divine perfection causes envy and irritation in mere mortals. So I smiled condescendingly and in a minute forgot what they were talking about. Why has fate treated me so unfairly? Ethan asked Thomas, why isn't she here? And I'm sitting here drinking cognac with you. It wasn't supposed to be like this. His friend sat looking at him and thinking how much was still a very deep wound, 
too fresh for him to think about anything but his loss. The thought of living and enjoying life, Ethan found sacrilegious. Life is such a thing, you never know what's around the corner. Thomas said, knowing full well that it was a poor consolation. As for Ethan himself, he was not relieved by this conversation. On the contrary, he felt infinitely lonely, neglected, unwanted. And Thomas seriously doubted whether Ethan would ever be able to forget his beloved woman. Not even to forget, and at least to stop feeding you for her departure and live with hindsight. He won't be able to let another one into his heart for a long time. After eight months, I began to notice that something was happening to her. To all my questions, she said she had a slight headache. I looked at the pills she was taking. They were painkillers. Sometimes at night, she'd sit in the living room and watch TV, even though it hadn't been on for a long time. Kelly, are you feeling sick? No, just insomnia. How's your headache? Then she started to look better and even had some fun. But after two months, her condition worsened dramatically. She held her head and said the pills didn't help. Should we go to the clinic? No, I'm not going. It'll pass now. But I saw that her condition was terrible, and this time I didn't give in. I took her by the hand and, no matter how much she resisted, put her in the car and drove her to the paid clinic. Her complexion, as we drove, had turned a sort of gray and she looked as if she had aged. I realized. Something terrible is happening. Yeah, I don't need help. I don't need the clinic, she assured me. Kelly, do this for me so I can rest assured that nothing terrible is happening to you. Okay, but this is the last time I'm not going to any more clinics. I've had enough of those hospitals. God, I asked then. Only if she was all right, although deep down I was prepared to hear the worst. Even mentally, I was already thinking about what lies I would tell Ola if she was found to have a terrible disease. But God did not hear me because the tests were disappointing. The brain tumor was not opera. You came too late, the doctor told me, at least a couple months earlier, and now it's too late. You're a doctor, you can see for yourself. I'm taking her to Germany, to Israel, where they can help. I'm sorry to disappoint you, but it's useless. Before you torture your wife, send those test results and you'll get an answer. I'm 200% sure it will be the same. Again, I'm sorry. Okay, not the surgery. But it's possible to prolong her life, if not stop, at least slow down the progression of the disease. Let's start the treatment, the medicine, the money, it's all there. Of course, we are not refusing treatment, but you must be ready at any moment. The tumor's too deep, there's a lot of blood vessels. We're not gods either, and we can't do everything yet. The doctor said regretfully. Kelly was admitted to the clinic. I sent her tests to every clinic in the world. In Germany, they refused immediately. In Israel, they gave me hope at first, but then they refused. So I called my friend in the States, asked him to find out everything, sent the tests. They told him to let him come, but we can't give any guarantees. The disease is neglected. Then I called Vitaly and asked to meet him. He only specified where and when. We met in the park, we looked at each other without anger, but we didn't give each other a hand. Kelly is dying, I said, and he immediately turned pale. What's wrong? Brain tumor. Gleb Plastum immediately asked him. Yes, all the clinics refused to take her. The tumor's not for. You can see the MRI results. I brought them with me at the time. And when he saw them, he cried. We both lost her. The treatment did nothing. And two months later, my snail was gone. I still can't believe it. That it's gone. It may sound cliché, but death is hard to get used to, especially since she suffered so much. A terrible death, Thomas said quietly. For the first month, I didn't know what to do. I felt like a ship without a helmsman, doomed to sail the seas forever and not docked on any shore. I told you fate doesn't like those who have everything. That's why it was taken from me, and covering his face with his hands, Ethan sobbed like a child. Thomas sat there unable to utter a word. He was crushed by the story and didn't know how to help his friend. It was as if Ethan had read his mind. Don't worry, Thomas. I could have told you all that. So back to life. She's not alive. But I am alive. Though I think it's unfair. If, in the opinion of those who knew our history, 
she did not deserve heaven. At least let her find peace, Ethan said. Will you be happy? Thomas took his hand. Probably, but not for a while. Subscribe and click the bell. The apartment was abuzz with pre-wedding bustle. The happy bride put herself in the hands of her bridesmaids and watched in the mirror the last preparations before leaving for the wedding ceremony. Nora, you are going to be the most beautiful bride. Helping to put on the dress, one of her friends spoke. Such a gorgeous dress. Another remarked, it must have cost a lot of money, right? Yes, blushing with pleasure, the bride replied. Edward told me not to save money and to choose one I liked. I couldn't resist and bought this. It fits you perfectly. It looks like it was made especially for you. It really accentuates your figure. It makes you look like a queen. When I get married, I'll buy one just like it. The fit and the fabric are beautiful. You have great taste, Nora. Nora was looking at herself in front of the mirror, her blue eyes shining. Her lush dark hair had been skillfully styled by the hairdresser's hand into an intricate style. You're lucky to have a fiancé, sighed one of the girls. And where do such men come from? One is an alcoholic, the other has money, but he's so stingy. He's lucky to have me. Nora laughed, pleased with the effect on her friends. Please straighten the hem, there are some creases. Oh, girls, suddenly she realized. Give me the necklace quickly, I almost forgot it. Ah, opening the box, admired her friends. It's fabulous. Nora, it is wonderful and looks so beautiful on your neck. You could be on the cover of a fashion magazine right now. You and Edward will outshine all the other newlyweds today. I'm so happy. Nora was glowing. Edward, he's so wonderful, and I love him so much. But it took him too long to marry you, and I don't know why he took so long. I knew right away you two would make a wonderful couple. You even look alike. That's the first sign that you were meant to be together. At least we've tested our feelings, and now there's no doubt that we're meant to be together. We have our whole lives ahead of us. In the matter of marriage rush is not necessary, so that then do not regret and do not run a year later in the institution of marriage, only already divorced. At that time the door opened and Margaret came into the room. Mommy, look at me, how do I look? Nora walked around the room, letting those around her admire herself. The girls were doing their best. It's wonderful, how beautiful you are. The woman brushed away an unsolicited tear. I can't believe you're getting married. It seems like only yesterday you were a baby and today you're already a bride. How quickly you've grown up. It's pathetic. Mom. The daughter came over and hugged her mother tenderly. I love you very much. How father was happy for you. The woman sneezed. He has already been with us for two years, and still in my head does not fit that I will never see him again. I'm sorry, dear. I've upset you. I shouldn't have brought him up on a day like this. You've got a wonderful event coming up. Let's stop talking about sad things and enjoy it. Come on, Mommy. I miss my father very much. He's always in my heart. Nora confessed. I miss him too. I know how hard it is to lose someone you've lived with all your life. He was a wonderful husband and father. Today he would take me to the wedding reception. Yes, we have raised a beautiful daughter. It's a shame he can't see that. Margaret smiled through her tears. I'm proud of you, daughter. I also dream of grandchildren. You and Edward have already thought about children, haven't you? I hope I don't have to wait another two years for them. Oh, wait. She looked at her daughter questioningly. Where is Edward? Why isn't he here? We have to leave now. Call him quickly. Where is he? I hope he'll meet us at the wedding venue. Edward? 
Nora was glad to hear her fiancé's voice on the phone. Edward, can you hear me? Where are you? The girl angrily interrupted the conversation. She couldn't hear anything. There was some noise in the receiver. It sounded like cars passing by. That's good. The mother was nervous, punctual by nature. She hated those who were late. So we're on the road, no reason to panic. I hope she doesn't get stuck in traffic. Oh, come on, Mommy. He just got a little out of sync. The bride stood up for the groom. You know his work takes up a lot of his time. Something urgent may have delayed him, but he'll make it. What work? It's not what he has to think about right now. You're having a wedding, too. Margaret sighed. They didn't want to have a traditional wedding. With a bride price and contests for the groom, it would have been fun, and the mood would have been festive. You know what kind of wedding my father and I had? The whole yard was celebrating. Something to remember in my old age, but what did you do? My dear mommy, Nora hugged her mother. It's not fashionable now, you know. People are all busy. They don't want to waste time on old-fashioned rituals. What's the point of all this? What's all this fancy? Mother shook her head reproachfully. Just meet at the marriage ceremony. You are now together for life. It's such an event. Don't be angry, dear. We are not 18 years old. We're adults, modern people. Why do we need these contests, posters, shouting? You also advise me to put a doll on the hood. It's the 21st century. Suddenly, there was an audacious knock on the door. Here comes Edward, with a triumphant look at those present. The bride announced, No, no, waving her arms, Margaret shouted. Don't you dare come out. It's bad luck to see a bride in her dress before the wedding. Listen to your mother, Nora. Don't go out to him. Mother, Nora laughed. What is this relic of the past? Harry? The smile slipped from her face. We're ready to leave now, but I can't get Edward on the phone. Have you talked to him lately? Do you know why he's late? He wouldn't pick up his cell phone, and now he's disconnected. Nora, with admiration, looking at the flushed girl, the man said, You are amazingly beautiful today. I'm sure you will outshine everyone at the wedding. My heart almost stopped when I saw you. You're dazzling in that dress. I envy Edward. Madam, he bowed jokingly. The carriage is ready. Please follow me. The man bent his arm at the elbow. Nora took him under her arm and followed him to the car. Don't worry about him. Don't overload your pretty head with non-existent problems. Maybe something happened to his phone. That's why he's not answering. I'm sure he's waiting for us at the wedding reception. You should be nervous. Edward can't be late for his own wedding. He's been looking forward to this day. I hope he has. I'm very nervous. Nora? Suddenly one of the girls shrieked. The bouquet. We almost forgot the bouquet. No. Terrified, Margaret shrieked as the young woman prepared to return to the apartment. Don't you dare come back. It's bad luck. Girls, someone take the bouquet. When you leave the apartment, be sure to look in the mirror. Mom, Nora sighed. What kind of prejudice is that? Together with Harry, she headed for the car. Nora, the girlfriends and Margaret followed. We're coming to get you. Don't panic. There's still time to register. Everything will be fine. You'll see in half an hour... This little misunderstanding will be resolved. Expectations were not justified. Among the gathered bridegrooms, the groom was not present. They were approached by friends who cheered the bride. Nora, you are unbelievably beautiful, and your outfit is so gorgeous. Are you upset about something? Where is Edward? Tears welled up in the bride's eyes. Why isn't he here yet? We thought he was coming with you. Don't be upset. She was being comforted from all sides. 
It's still 15 minutes before the ceremony starts. He'll definitely come, you'll see. He can't leave you just before the registration, can he? Edward is not capable of such meanness. Let's wait, in case something's wrong. He'll come and explain everything. Oh, I don't like this. Margaret was nervous. Call, where did he disappear to? We can't go after him, can we? It's embarrassing. The groom didn't show up at the wedding. He disconnected the phone. Nora said confusedly, listening to the perky female voice of the answering machine. I don't understand. What's going on? He couldn't have turned off the phone. Her friend reassured her. The battery is probably dead. You know what happens. Or did he change his mind about marrying me? There were tears buried in her wedding dress. Don't make this up, Nora. Edward couldn't do that to you. If he's not here, then something serious must have happened. What? What could have happened? How hard would it be to just call and tell him he was running late? How can he warn you if he's in trouble? God forbid. He'll be here any minute. But as time went on, Edward didn't show up. Finally, Another happy couple came out from behind the door. Nora. The girl was surrounded by her friends. We should go. It's our turn. Where's Edward? What happened? When was the last time he called you? How could he? That doesn't sound like Edward. You two didn't have a fight the night before. He couldn't just not come to his own wedding, could he? It can't be. He's crazy about you. Leave her alone. Can you see that the girl is upset? Margaret hugged her crying daughter. We don't know what happened to Edward. We're at a loss. The phone is off. Can't anyone tell us what happened? Why didn't he come? Harry, we all turn to the man. You're friends with Edward, aren't you? Come on, what happened? Why was he so mean to Nora? Did he say anything to you? Think back, Harry, humiliating, Nora looked at him. Tell me honestly, did he change his mind about getting married? Did he just run away from me? Scared? You confide all your secrets to each other. Surely you must be guessing where he is. Please tell me, I don't know what to think. If you're offended, I don't know why. We didn't have any problems last night. All we talked about was the wedding. Nora... I swear he didn't tell me about his plans. I called him a few times, too. His phone's disconnected. He didn't say anything about not coming to the wedding venue. There was no hint that he had changed his mind, or was at all hesitant to marry you. We saw him yesterday afternoon, and he was content and happy, looking forward to the wedding. He said he loved you very much and wished he'd propose sooner. I can't think why he's still not here. Yes, then where is he? Why isn't he standing here with me? Why do I have to blush in front of the guests? I didn't push him to get married. He asked me to marry him. And now it turns out he didn't need it at all. If he so easily didn't come, and the most offensive thing is that he did it without explanation. What a position he's put me in, and on my wedding day. I don't recognize Edward, or do I not know him well? Nora, calm down. Margaret stroked her daughter's shoulder. Things happen in life. A guy gets nervous, he backslides, who doesn't? It shouldn't have happened to me, Mom, you know? We're not children to be afraid of responsibility. If you changed your mind, why don't you just tell me honestly? Why don't you just show up like that? That's mean. That's low. I don't deserve to be treated like this. Nora. Harry was frantically thinking of what to do, what to say to calm the offended bride. I'm sure Edward will be able to explain everything. We just have to wait for him. We'll all calm down and be patient. Tell me. The girl attacked Harry. What do we do now? How long do we wait? It's clear he's not coming. He left me at the doorstep of the marriage institution. 
How can I bear the shame? Now everyone's going to point fingers. You abandoned girl. I wonder what he's doing. While I'm standing here like a fool waiting for him. And tomorrow the whole firm will laugh at me when I show up at work. Pull yourself together, please. Let's be logical. He couldn't have left you. It's as clear as day. I think something happened to him. Shit, shit, shit. Edward was nervous. I'm so screwed. I'm so screwed. How could such a stupid situation happen to me? He stretched his hand up, hoping that a miracle would happen and the phone would catch the network so he could call Nora and explain. You'd have to get stuck in an elevator on the day of your own wedding. Can you imagine what's happening to Nora? But it's not my fault the elevator broke down and the repair crew is in no hurry to get me out of here. I wonder how much longer I'll have to stay here. He dialed the dispatcher's number. Girl, honey, do you realize that I have to get out of here as soon as possible? How long do I have to wait? Are you going to do anything about it? Listen to me. A woman's voice on the other end of the line answered him indifferently. Stop calling. This is the fifth time in the last half hour you've dialed the control room. You're wasting the line. I told you very clearly, the master will come when he can. What's not to understand? Your situation is not so critical, and in the next house stuck mom with a baby in her arms, and her first priority we must save, is that clear? Just wait. It's not my fault that elevators are always breaking down, and the master is one for several houses. Nothing will happen to you if you stay in the locked cabin a little longer. My situation is critical too, shouted Edward. My fiancé is waiting for me at the wedding reception. The guests, the table in the restaurant is booked, and I'm stuck here, though I should be putting a ring on my beloved's finger. Do you realize that by your grace, the family is ruined before it's even born? She's not going to believe I'm stuck here by accident. Imagine yourself in her shoes. Have some compassion. You've got to think of something like that. The dispatcher said angrily, It's his wedding. They could have come up with something more original. You don't believe me? The man was indignant. If my fiancé leaves me, it will be on your conscience. You have no heart. Stop occupying the line. I cannot jump above my head. As soon as the master is free, I will immediately send to you. But in the meantime, be patient. Wait, said the woman and hung up. That's great. Annoyed Edward banged his fist on the elevator wall. It's the worst thing in the world, waiting and catching up. I hope Nora will understand and forgive me for being stuck here. What if she thinks I'm a coward? He clutched his head with his hands. I'm so screwed. I'm so screwed. Guilt-free. Some more time passed, and suddenly the elevator came to life and moved. Well, recluse, come on out. The elevator doors opened, and in front of Edward was an elderly smiling master in special clothes, with a tool case in his hands. Sorry, brother. I couldn't get you out earlier. Edward stormed out of the booth, nearly knocking the man to the ground. What a freak! What's he doing running like that? The foreman shook his head disapprovingly. So what if he sat in the elevator for a while? The world didn't collapse. The unhappy groom dialed the number of the cab. To the wedding reception. He said as he got into the car, Are you late for the wedding? Looking in the rearview mirror at the young man, in a strict suit with a boutonniere on his jacket lapel, the driver asked, You're already late. Edward said bitterly, I'm afraid everyone's already gone. Listen, friend. He turned to the driver. Wait for me. All right, but don't take too long. The unmarried groom flew down the stairs in one fell swoop and burst into the wedding hall. Where is it? He asked and hesitated. What do you want? Tiredly asked the woman, collecting papers from the table. Everyone went away, who wanted to be married, 
And you were looking for whom? A bribe? Edward waved his hand hopelessly and went to the cab. On the way, dialing a friend's cell phone number. Harry, where are you? Edward at last. Where have you been? I'll tell you later. Where's Nora? Well, we're at the restaurant, celebrating a wedding, so it's not a waste. Whose wedding? The man got in the car. Drive to the restaurant. He told the driver and gave the address. When the man entered the hall, the guests immediately quieted down in anticipation, looked at each other, whispered, discussing the appearance of the long-awaited groom. Nora? A friend touched the young woman's arm. Edward is here. Oh, my God! Nora splashed her hands. Look who's here! Edward, you're just in time as always, and we've been waiting for you. Daughter, her mother warned her. Stop, don't make a scene. First find out why he was late. Let him explain. I hope he has something to say for himself. What's the matter, Mommy? Why do I need a scandal? Why spoil the party? Come in, Edward. You'll be a guest at our wedding. What are you talking about? The groom is worried. What do you mean, your wedding? What is it? I'm getting married. Congratulations, I got married just like I wanted. How could you get married if I wasn't here? That's exactly why. Nora came right up to Edward. I finally got married with you as a bride. I'd have had to wait until I retired, and I was tired of waiting for you. Wait a minute. Nora squinted angrily. Let me see, how many times have we postponed our wedding? Three times, because Edward wanted us to, and he always had a very convincing reason to say no, and now he's finally decided to make me happy. Everything seemed ready for the long-awaited event. The bride circled the hall. The guests are invited. The wedding is scheduled. The restaurant is booked and suddenly interferes with his majesty of chance, the groom did not show up at his own wedding. Ay, 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 what a nuisance. The bride is weeping. The guests are perplexed. What scandal. Wait. Edward tried to stop her, grabbed her by the arms, turned her around. I can explain everything. There was a funny situation. I got stuck in the elevator. Honestly, I can even bring a certificate from the dispatcher. It's a completely stupid story, like in the joke. And I don't want to hear it. Nora broke free of her ex fiancés grip. You think it's funny? Let's laugh together. We have a party, guests are here. Tables are booked. We can't waste the good. Friends. She addressed the crowd, who froze, not knowing what to do in such a situation. Let's help ourselves. Everything is paid for. Smile. Toastmaster, invite guests to the table. I want to drink. Why don't we postpone the wedding? Edward tried to stop Nora from going wild. I swear, this is definitely the last time. There's no need to reschedule. I got married. And conveniently, I didn't even have to change anything. Just the groom's name. To whom? Edward stared at her, dumbfounded. To your best friend, Harry. So the wedding took place, Edward, but without you. As you can see, there are no irreplaceables. What are you talking about? How could you marry him if you were going to marry me? Are you talking out of spite to me now? I understand, and I'm not even offended. What right do you have to take offense at me? I didn't leave you, you left me. I didn't dump you, Nora. I love you. In despair, Edward didn't know what other words to use to convince his fiancé that it wasn't his fault. I've decided I've had enough, and I've married Harry, darling. She took the man under her arm, pressed herself against him. Tell my ex fiancé we married you? So this isn't a joke? Boiling, Edward. You just marry the first guy you meet despite me? Harry's not a first mate. He's been in love with me a long time, and he's always there for me, unlike you. 
Get lost. You're not welcome here. Honored guests, let's keep the party going. Harry is she joking. Edward looked at his friend confusedly. He was silent. I don't believe it. You couldn't do this to me. I love you. It's the resentment in you right now. Yes, I postponed the wedding several times, but not because I doubted my feelings for you, but because I was afraid of losing my freedom. Edward, what's the matter? You're free. You're free from your obligations, from me, from having to get married. No one's going to restrict your rights if that's what you're so afraid of. I'm going to have a man by my side who's not afraid of responsibility. He didn't have to think about whether or not to marry me. He didn't have to wait, check his feelings, talk about his lost freedom. He went ahead and married me. Harry? Edward turned pale and looked at his friend. I didn't expect you to be so mean. We've been friends since we were kids. I never thought you could do this to me. I was just supporting Nora. The man replied to his friend's attack. I couldn't do otherwise. Seeing her deceived, humiliated was beyond me. And then something happened that no one expected. Edward swung and drove his fist into Harry's face, causing him to fall, his nose bleeding. What have you done? Nora shrieked, rushing over to Harry. Somebody get me a tissue and call an ambulance. Don't call an ambulance, the man asked, sitting down on the floor. There's nothing wrong with me. I lost more than just my fiancé today. Edward looked contemptuously first at one, then at the other, but also your best friend. I wish you happiness. Edward, rubbing his bruised arm, turned around and walked out of the hall. He didn't remember how he had gotten to the street. He walked swaying, as if drunk, unable to make out the road. When he noticed a bench, he sat down, tore the boutonniere from the lapel of his jacket, threw it in the trash can, grabbed his head, and groaned. A man? He heard a voice beside him. You're not feeling well? Should I call an ambulance? You're not yourself. An ambulance won't help. He looked at the old woman who was staring anxiously at his face. It's all right. Don't worry. Did you have a fight with your wife? She asked sympathetically. Nothing to make up. Who doesn't? Edward looked sadly at the woman, but said nothing. She stood by him for a while and then walked away. The man got up, caught a cab, and in a few minutes was already entering the entrance of his house. Now you work like clockwork, he grinned, when the elevator doors opened obligingly in front of him. Because of you, my whole life has gone down the drain. I lost my fiancé and found out that my best childhood friend was a traitor who took advantage of the situation and married her. How am I supposed to move on with my life? He stepped out on his floor, opened the apartment door, stumbled through the suitcases in the floor of the dark hallway. We had to. He grinned bitterly and kicked the suitcases standing in the driveway. To go on a wedding trip with Nora. And now what? Nothing. Now I want to get drunk. Everything collapsed, crumbled like a house of cards. The man went into the living room, took a full bottle of whiskey, a glass, a snack, and sat down on the sofa. Well, Edward? He turned to himself, raising the whiskey glass. You're free again. Only I'm not bloody happy about it. He downed the glass, grimaced, and poured the next one. Why would I want that kind of freedom? I'm not just free, I'm alone. Why do I need all this? How could I have been so wrong about Nora? How could she even take and just replace one fiancé with another? How could I have been so blind? On the other hand, he took another sip of the hot drink. For too long, I was going to marry her. Then there's that elevator thing. I can't. I can't believe they'd do such a mean thing to me. But they did, didn't they? How am I supposed to go on? I don't understand. 
He closed his eyes, the empty glass fell out of his hand, and Edward fell into a heavy sleep. In the morning, Nora was awakened by the doorbell. Disheveled, her eyes reddened with tears and sleepless night, she grudgingly went out into the hallway and opened the door. Hello. Harry was standing on the doorstep. I'm sorry I'm so early. I couldn't help but come over. Hi. Nora stepped aside to let him into the apartment. How are you? I'm sorry. I asked a stupid question. He was embarrassed. I'm hanging in there, as you can see, still alive. Any regrets about yesterday? I don't know. She wrapped herself in her robe. I just wanted to check up on him. I was expecting him to make a scene, to yell, to be indignant, but he, he believed that I could cheat on him. You saw, he hardly ever swore. Do you understand? He had no doubt in his mind that it was true. And I was stupid, expecting him to meet me at my house and beg me to forget everything to start again, or at least call me, but nothing happened. He didn't come, he didn't call. I'd even felt like he didn't care, just walked away. It turns out he never cared about me. Married is good, not married is good. One less thing to worry about. The shame is not that he was late to the marriage ceremony, but that he believed in treason and did not even allow the thought that I deliberately invented everything. You're wrong. I'm sure Edward is very upset about what happened. You're his most precious possession. At least that's how it always seemed to me. I was wrong when I thought he loved me. I imagined that we'd be happy, that we'd be together forever, that we'd make a perfect couple. I pictured in my mind what a good father he'd be. I made plans for the future. God, she covered her face with her hands. How stupid and knave I was. I should have forgotten about him the first time he moved up the wedding date. He said it was temporary, that he was having some problems at work, and he didn't want them to mar our married life. But it was. I know what I'm talking about. Then he postponed the date again, explaining that he was offered an extra job and he wanted to earn more money for our wedding, and a part-time job would not be superfluous, and I believed again. The girl smiled unhappily. You should trust him. You shouldn't have. You should have run away from him then, so that you wouldn't be in such a stupid position now. It doesn't make any difference now, though. She fell powerless into silence, her hands on her knees. Her blue eyes were faded, and the life seemed to have gone out of them. She shook her mop of dark hair. Maybe it's a good thing it happened this way, and I can see now that he doesn't love me. But how am I supposed to live now? I don't know. He was the best thing for me. No one else. I never even thought about. It all happened so fast. Even in my wildest dreams, I couldn't imagine that we'd ever break up with him. It's a shame. Harry said with a sigh, that you love him and not me. I would never have betrayed you. I'd have broken myself to pieces, but I wouldn't have let a single tear fall from your beautiful eyes. You're a very good friend. I'm sorry. Nora looked guiltily at Harry for dragging you into all this. I said the first thing I could think of, just to spite him, but I didn't think he'd believe it. And then he came at you with his fists. She put her hand to the man's cheek, which had a bruise on it. Did it hurt? I'm so ashamed of Edward. So easily and simply doubting you and me, it hurts. I will never forgive him. Nora. Harry took her hands in his. I'm always here for you. If you need help, remember, just call me. I'd do anything for you. Anything you want, I'll do. You know how I feel about you, don't you? Harry, you're so good, but I love Edward and I can't help it. So what's next? If he doesn't call, are you just going to suffer? I'll go. She stood up resolutely. I'll talk to him quietly, explain everything. 
I think he's already realized that he made a mistake, but he's afraid to admit it. You know he's proud. And then I need to find out if he was really delayed by the elevator. That story sounds too far-fetched. What if it really happened? Then what if I was wrong to be mad at him? Let you down. No, thank you. Nora shook his hand, looking at him gratefully. I'll do it. Thank you so much for your support. It would have been very hard without you. I can imagine how you must be feeling about the fight with Edward. I'm ashamed to be the bone of contention between you two. When I explain it to him, I'm sure you'll reconcile and he'll understand. After seeing Harry off, the girl quickly cleaned herself up and went to her lover's house. She imagined that they would laugh about the accident, hug, Edward would kiss her, and everything would be like it was before. Nora firmly pressed the call button and was answered by silence. Strange, she said thoughtfully. It doesn't open. Where could he have gone? Maybe he went to the store. I'll try calling. She dialed the man's number. No answer? Why? Doesn't want to talk? The girl still stood under the doors and then returned home. There her mother was already waiting for her. Daughter, where have you been? I'm exhausted. Why don't you answer the phone? I turned off the sound. I don't want to talk to anyone. Sorry, even to you, I wanted to be alone. Nora went into the living room without undressing and sank down tiredly on the sofa. Mom, he's not home. He's not answering my calls. What am I going to do? I feel so bad. Did you go to Edward? My mother was surprised. Don't you have any pride left? I did. I wanted to tell him everything, but I kissed the closed door and came back with nothing. Well, what did you want? After news like that, any man's gonna lose his temper. It's all right. He'll pout and come back. I didn't think my innocent deception would go this far. I didn't even think he'd believe it. He should have realized that you can't change from one groom to another in a few minutes before registration. He must have been so angry with you that he lost his judgment. He was jealous of Harry, especially since he added fuel to the fire with his declaration of love for you. I didn't even realize he was secretly in love with you, always keeping a low profile with Edward. I don't know what to do. Nora was desperate. I love Edward. I don't need anyone but him, and he won't even try to talk to me after everything. How do I get him back? How do I make him listen? Mommy? She rushed to her mother, hugged her. I don't want to live without him. Oh, daughter, I'm not a good counselor. If he loves you, he'll come back. Or maybe it was just an excuse to finally let you realize that for him bachelor life is better than marital duties. There's a kind of man who's not cut out for married life. I don't believe that. This isn't about Edward. Time will tell, but in the meantime, try to calm down. Look at what happened as a test of your feelings, and let him come to his senses. You need a break from each other, and then you'll get together and talk about it. Figure out who's right and who's wrong. How am I going to get to work? The girl cried. You'll have to see him every day. I don't know how. Should I quit? You'll get over it. God put up with it. Smart people will understand and sympathize, but fools talk, talk, and forget. And then maybe things will get better for you. A week later, Nora returned to work. She slowly approached the office. Her heart was racing. As soon as she entered the office, the firm's chief gossip girl immediately flew in. You're a very good friend. I'm sorry. Nora looked guiltily at Harry for dragging you into all this. I said the first thing I could think of just to spite him, but I didn't think he'd believe it. And then he came at you with his fists. She put her hand to the man's cheek which had a bruise on it. Did it hurt? I'm so ashamed of Edward. 
So easily and simply doubting you and me, it hurts. I will never forgive him. Nora, Harry took her hands in his. I'm always here for you. If you need help, remember, just call me. I'd do anything for you. Anything you want, I'll do. You know how I feel about you, don't you? Harry, you're so good, but I love Edward and I can't help it. So what's next? If he doesn't call, are you just going to suffer? I'll go. She stood up resolutely. I'll talk to him quietly, explain everything. I think he's already realized that he made a mistake, but he's afraid to admit it. You know he's proud. And then I need to find out if he was really delayed by the elevator. That story sounds too far-fetched. What if it really happened? Then what if I was wrong to be mad at him? Let you down? No, thank you. Nora shook his hand, looking at him gratefully. I'll do it. Thank you so much for your support. It would have been very hard without you. I can imagine how you must be feeling about the fight with Edward. I'm ashamed to be the bone of contention between you two. When I explain it to him, I'm sure you'll reconcile and he'll understand. After seeing Harry off, the girl quickly cleaned herself up and went to her lover's house. She imagined that they would laugh about the accident, hug, Edward would kiss her, and everything would be like it was before. Nora firmly pressed the call button and was answered by silence. Strange, she said thoughtfully. It doesn't open. Where could he have gone? Maybe he went to the store. I'll try calling. She dialed the man's number. No answer. Why? Doesn't want to talk? The girl still stood under the doors and then returned home. There her mother was already waiting for her. Daughter, where have you been? I'm exhausted. Why don't you answer the phone? I turned off the sound. I don't want to talk to anyone. Sorry, even to you. I wanted to be alone. Nora went into the living room without undressing and sank down tiredly on the sofa. Mom, he's not home. He's not answering my calls. What am I going to do? I feel so bad. Did you go to Edward? My mother was surprised. Don't you have any pride left? I did. I wanted to tell him everything, but I kissed the closed door and came back with nothing. Well, what did you want? After news like that, any man's gonna lose his temper. It's all right, he'll pout and come back. I didn't think my innocent deception would go this far. I didn't even think he'd believe it. He should have realized that you can't change from one groom to another in a few minutes before registration. He must have been so angry with you that he lost his judgment. He was jealous of Harry, especially since he added fuel to the fire with his declaration of love for you. I didn't even realize he was secretly in love with you, always keeping a low profile with Edward. I don't know what to do. Nora was desperate. I love Edward. I don't meet anyone but him, and he won't even try to talk to me after everything. How do I get him back? How do I make him listen? Mommy? She rushed to her mother, hugged her. I don't want to live without him. Oh, daughter, I'm not a good counselor. If he loves you, he'll come back. Or maybe it was just an excuse to finally let you realize that for him bachelor life is better than marital duties. There's a kind of man who's not cut out for married life. I don't believe that. This isn't about Edward. Time will tell, but in the meantime, try to calm down. Look at what happened as a test of your feelings, and let him come to his senses. You need a break from each other, and then you'll get together and talk about it. Figure out who's right and who's wrong. How am I going to get to work? The girl cried. You'll have to see him every day. I don't know how. Should I quit? You'll get over it. God put up with it. Smart people will understand and sympathize, but fools talk, talk, and forget. And then, maybe things will get better for you. A week later, 
Nora returned to work, she slowly approached the office. Her heart was racing. As soon as she entered the office, the firm's chief gossip girl immediately flew in. Nora, Wendy looked at her curiously. When I found out that your fiancé left you, right before the marriage ceremony, I almost went crazy. How could he do that to you? She looked at the girl with sympathy. Poor girl. I probably would have died of grief. But I didn't want to die, sorry. I was just speaking figuratively, no offense. I can imagine how you must be feeling right now. What happened? Why did he do that to you? We've had the whole office buzzing for a week, and we were supposed to celebrate your wedding today. How pathetic is that? Tell me, why didn't the wedding happen? I'm dying of curiosity. Did you find out he's seeing someone else? Yes, Edward and I didn't get married, but don't sensationalize the news. Why not? Why didn't we? Because he was late for the wedding. What do you mean he was late? The woman was stunned. Does that happen? As you can see, it does. He was late through no fault of his own. He was on his way to the wedding venue, but he got stuck in the elevator. Really? What a number! Wendy listened avidly to the story of Nora and Edward's breakup, her eyes almost bulging with surprise. So what now? Have you set a new wedding date yet? When? No, we've decided to break up. What do you mean, break up? You two are such a beautiful couple, and you've been together for months. This situation has made us rethink a lot of things. We decided it was best for both of us. Oh, that's a shame. But you two are so right for each other. I'm so, so sorry. I really sympathize. Breaking up over some stupid incident. Can't you make up? I'm sorry. It's been a busy week. Nora began to study the papers, trying to get rid of the annoying interlocutor. When she had everything she wanted, Wendy ran back to her room. Nora knew that now she would tell her colleagues in detail about the failed wedding, not forgetting to make up something, but she did not care. She caught sympathetic glances, and as soon as she walked into the office, the conversations died down. For a whole week, the entire office plankton had been discussing Nora's personal life. Why don't you ask? Asked a few days later, one of her co-workers, where's Edward? Don't you care where he's gone? Or didn't you even notice his absence? I'm not interested in knowing. Nora frowned, though she'd been curious about it for a long time. We were going on vacation, probably still at sea. I'm the one who came back to work early. No, he immediately after your spat wrote an application for transfer to another branch of our firm, and he was transferred. He didn't want to see you to avoid upsetting you more after what he'd done. So, you really did not know anything. The woman pretended to be surprised. I was sure everyone knew. I didn't, and I don't care at all where he is now. Coldly, Nora replied, I hope he doesn't come back here again. He left, didn't even say anything, and I was hoping I'd see him and explain everything. Why did he do that to me? God, I'm such an idiot. Why did I just blurt out that I married Harry? Why didn't I listen to him? I attacked him at once, insulted him by mistrusting him. And he's good. She justified herself to herself. He dropped everything and cut me out of his life. Nora? One morning, Wendy met her in the hallway of the firm and gave her a sly wink. There were flowers for you, so I put them on your desk. Such an attentive man, and what a gorgeous bouquet. Flowers? The woman rejoiced, her heart snapped with happiness. It's Edward. He changed his mind and came back. As if on wings, she ran to the office, grabbed the bouquet, pressed it to her chest, buried her nose in the flowers, savoring the fragrance. Then she opened the card and almost cried. Dear Nora, she read. 
I can't bear to see you suffer. I invite you to dinner at the restaurant tonight. Harry, did you like my present? She heard behind her and flinched in surprise. Yes, thank you. Wiping away tears, Nora answered, turning to the man. She smiled, though she wanted to weep at the top of her voice. The flowers are beautiful. It's my pleasure, but it wasn't worth the expense. Do you accept my invitation? The man asked insistently, not listening to any objections. Harry, the woman hesitated. I'm not in the mood for restaurants, you must understand. I don't feel like going out at all, and after work I have to go home right away. All urgent matters can be postponed for later. I don't take no for an answer, the man said decisively. Edward's gone. You can't stay locked up for the rest of your life. You need to relax a little, take your mind off things. You've had enough of being cooped up like a nun. Let's go out. It's no obligation, just a friendly dinner. I won't ask for anything in return. Can I afford to take a beautiful woman to a restaurant? I guess you're right. After some thought, she agreed. Let's go out because I'm going to go crazy with worry. That's great. Harry was happy. Then I'll meet you in the parking lot right after work. I'm glad you said yes. I wanted to do something nice for you. He took her to the most expensive restaurant in town. I've never been here before. Robia, Nora remarked, looking around at the fancy furnishings. Nora. Harry spoke softly, helping her to a seat at the table. His eyes glittered feverishly. His eyes were filled with desire. I'd do anything for you, and the restaurant is just a little thing, just a good time. Thank you. I appreciate your concern, but I shouldn't have spent so much. She was uncomfortable with the man's insistent stare. Everything here is too expensive. I don't feel comfortable. It's nothing. I should have told you a long time ago, but I didn't dare for fear of hurting you. What do you mean? Nora looked at him in bewilderment. But I can't keep quiet anymore, either. It's pathetic to watch you suffer because you've broken up with Edward and he's not worth your little finger. Haven't you forgotten how he treated you? I'll never forgive him for that. How can you say that? Edward is your friend. After all, we're all entitled to make mistakes. I'm wrong, too. Yes, he's my friend, but I care about you, too. So it's my duty to tell you the truth. I can't keep silent any longer, knowing that you've been deceived all this time. I feel like an accomplice because I didn't say anything to you, because I didn't say anything. I don't know what you mean. Nora got a chill inside. I'm afraid you won't like what I'm about to say. Harry paused for a moment, then continued. Edward has another woman, and she's expecting a child with him. He's been hesitant to tell you, so he's been holding off on the wedding. The elevator was just an excuse to finally break up with you for good. You know he left right away, right? He left with that woman. But they're probably already married because the baby's due soon. Edward, cheating though he was, couldn't leave the baby without a last name. That's why he disappeared so quickly. No, with tears in her eyes, Nora whispered. He couldn't do this to me. I don't believe you. I would have known, felt that he had another. Are you saying this so I won't be so hurt by his betrayal? But you're making it worse. Shut up. I don't want to hear any more about it. I understand. Harry said softly, taking her hands in his. You love him, but he has neglected your love for another woman. And that's the truth he kept from you and demanded my silence. He didn't have the courage to confess his adultery. He ran away like a coward, unable to appreciate your feelings. He's not worthy of your love. I realize you're confused and depressed, thinking you're alone, but you're not. There is a man next to you who is ready to support you, to protect you, to warm you with his warmth. Look at me, Edward's gone and I'm here. What do you want from me? T 
Tears were streaming from Nora's eyes. She hardly knew what was happening. There was only one thought running through her mind. He has another. He's had another woman all this time. Why did I ignore the obvious? Was I afraid to find out the truth? No, it can't be. Edward is incapable of lying. I feel in my heart that it's a deception, a trap. And if it were true... She was tormented by the worm of doubt in her heart. Nora, Harry caught her eye. You know how I feel about you, don't you? If you agree to give me a chance to be there for you, to support you, to comfort you, I will prove that my love is stronger. I'll do anything to make you forget to even think about him. But I, I don't love you. Frankly confess the young woman. And I don't think I'll ever love you the way I love Edward. Why do you need me? It doesn't matter. Harry hurried on, noticing the change in her eyes. First surprise, then doubt. I assure you that my love is enough for the two of us, and in time you will love me too. Just don't refuse now. Think about it. I'm in no hurry. Promise to think about it. I don't need much, just to know that I have at least a modicum of hope that I'll feel the same way. And Nora suddenly realized that she needed a man's firm shoulder right now. Harry was so sincere that she believed him. Yes, I promise to think about it. She answered the persistent bow. Thank you. He sighed in relief and started kissing her hands. You don't know how happy I am to hear you say that. I've always been jealous of Edward. Even in my mind, I was afraid to think of you in any other way than as my best friend's fiancé. And now, now I am free to look at you with tenderness, with love, and no one can stop me from doing so. You are my goddess. I am ready to pray to you. Nora blushed at such words. Harry, you're rushing things. Yes, I am. Because I've lost a lot of time envying other people's happiness but now I won't miss the opportunity to make you mine. Harry wooed her beautifully. Nora had heard the office gossip about her and Harry's relationship more than once. Look at her. No sooner had the trail of one suitor gone cold than another appeared. She's not the least bit embarrassed to accept his advances. Some people are lucky. You don't know how to get one, but she has two suitors at once. What do they see in her? No skin, no face. Don't tell me. She's beautiful, stylish. What's wrong with me? What's wrong with me? Maybe she knows some kind of spell for men. Let's ask her. Happy. Harry puts flowers on her table every morning, takes her to restaurants. But I don't think she's very happy about it. She's still pining for Edward. No, Harry's as good a groom as Edward. Nora was uncomfortable with such talk, but she tried to ignore it. There was indeed a bouquet of flowers waiting for her every morning. Why, Harry, why? It's such a waste of money. Don't. It makes me uncomfortable in front of my co-workers. I like it. It's fun, he told her. To please the woman I love, and I don't care about the people around me. You're giving food to the gossip mongers. So what? Let them envy you, but tonight we're going to the theater. He put the tickets in front of her. Harry. Nora shook her hands. It's been 100 years since I've been to the theater. Thank you. I knew you'd like it. The best reward for me is seeing the smile on your face. I'm happy I can take your mind off your sad thoughts for a while. I'm very grateful to you. Nora was embarrassed when, at times like this, Harry tried to hug her and kiss her. She wanted to be more affectionate with him, but something kept stopping her, and in the evenings, alone, she cried into her pillow and remembered Edward's kisses, which gave her goosebumps, as if she were in his arms. Harry had been paying attention not only to Nora, but to her mother as well. What a man! She admired Harry when he once again presented her with a small gift and flowers. Attentive, caring, and he loves you, you can tell. What more do you want? What do you want? 
That's the kind of man every woman dreams of. Is one better than the other? What do you see in Edward? Where is he now? No one knows. Never heard from, never seen. Vanished, vanished, as if he never existed. And Harry's always there. If he proposes, don't you dare refuse. There's no such thing as a man on the prowl. Mama, I don't love him. How can you marry without love? You'd be fooling him and yourself, and then you'd suffer all your life. So what is she going to suffer? There's your love. How did it turn out? Tears and sleepless nights. Have you seen yourself in the mirror? Only eyes left on your face, and they'll soon be tears. The main thing is that the man loved, and you respected him, and then you will not notice how you fall in love. Such a man is easy to love. It was six months before Edward disappeared. One day, Harry, waiting for her after work, said, "I've asked our director for a few days' vacation without your consent." Why? Without looking at the man, Nora asked, "I'm not going anywhere. I bought a vacation home. A change of scenery won't hurt you. I can't look at you without crying." And then. He smiled enigmatically. I have a surprise. Shall we go? The hotel's booked. They're waiting for us. By the way, your mom approved the trip. Okay, let's go. With a sigh, the woman agreed. Just promise me if I don't like it, we'll come back right away. Deal. Cheerfully, the man replied. But I'm sure you will still be begging me to stay there. Vacation in Sosnovibor. On the shore of a picturesque lake, did its job. Nora was revitalized, smiling more often. How grateful I am to you for bringing me here. The woman confessed once, admiring the sunset. The dark surface of the lake had a calming effect on her. I knew you'd like it. It's nice and quiet here. No one is whispering behind your back, discussing your personal life. It's a shame we can't stay here forever, but we can always come back. The last night they sat at the restaurant for dinner. Nora, do you know how I feel about you? I've waited a long time for this moment, and now I've made up my mind. He took a velvet box out of his jacket pocket, opened it, and said solemnly, "Marry me. I promise you will never regret that you said yes to me. I love you very much." And I hope one day you'll say those words to me too. Why aren't you saying anything? Do you agree? Yes, Nora answered decisively. I agree to marry you. Harry rejoiced. He put a small diamond ring on her finger. My beloved, holding her hands in his and looking at her admiringly, said the satisfied groom, "We have many beautiful days ahead of us." Without cloudy family happiness, you don't realize what a gift you have given me by accepting my proposal. Nora didn't feel particularly happy about the upcoming wedding. I'll try to love him in time. She consoled herself. Mama was right. It's a win-win situation. Who else would I wait for? And Harry, here he is, kind, gentle, tender, affectionate. What about Edward? It's a pain in my heart. He's with someone else. I must forget him, erase him from my memory. Nora and Harry had been married for almost a year. He was madly in love with her, trying to win the young woman's affection. He gave her gifts, took her on weekend trips, bought her a car. Alas, Nora did not reciprocate. I don't see any joy on your face. Her mother was so impressed with her. Harry would go to pieces to get any sign of attention from you, and you can't get enough. What do you want? Why do you torture him? Mom, I don't know why I married him. I don't feel anything for him. It's been a year, and we're like strangers. I think we made an irreparable mistake getting married. He played on my loneliness after I broke up with Edward. I didn't realize what I was doing, and I don't know how to fix it now. What? Are you crazy? Is this how you respond to his concern? 
Is it hard for you to be nicer to him? He's a good man, and he deserves your attention. He wants kids. So give him a child. Then the stupid thoughts will go out of your head. You're the one who's doing nothing. When you have a baby, you won't have time to think about silly things. Children bring us closer together. How can I have a child with a man I don't love? Do you want him to be miserable like his parents? No, I'd rather be alone. What are you making up? The mother was indignant. You're ungrateful. I don't know how Harry still puts up with you. If I were him, I'd have dropped everything and run away. Mother, how can you talk to me like that? I was hoping you'd be supportive. You're my daughter, but I can't bear to see you both suffer. And it's all your fault. Do you know how many families live without passion for each other? And they live, they have babies. Did you and Dad ever really love each other? We were different. Mother was embarrassed. So do I, Mommy. I want to wake up and fall asleep in the arms of a desirable man and not shudder at his every touch. I think I'm gonna go. She immediately got ready and went outside. It was a beautiful spring day. Nora wandered aimlessly through the city, remembering the unpleasant conversation with her mother. Nora? Suddenly she heard a familiar voice and shuddered in surprise. Hello. Edward? Hello. I didn't expect to see you here. I heard you'd gone away. I did, but now I'm back, and I'm very glad to see you. He looked at her carefully, his eyes shining with happiness. How are you living? I'm fine, and you? Can I congratulate you? On what? Perplexed stared at her former fiancé. What did you have, a boy or a girl? What are you talking about? I don't understand you. Harry said you were supposed to have a baby. Edward stared at her, frozen with amazement, and he gradually began to understand her words. I don't know why he thought I was supposed to have a baby, but I think we should talk to you. Don't you think? Yes, you're probably right. The young woman agreed. I'd like to get some answers to some questions. There is a great cafe nearby. I suggest we go there and have a cup of coffee to our chance meeting. In silence, they reached the cafe and ordered. You've lost weight, pale. Edward noticed. Tell me, how did you know I had a child? When you disappeared without telling me, Harry said you'd gone off with the mother of your child, that all this wedding stuff was just an excuse to get rid of me. What are you talking about? Edward was indignant. I was madly in love with you. Yes, I was afraid of losing my freedom, but that's the fear of a bachelor. I couldn't imagine life without you. How could you even think that about me? Why would I deceive you? I never had any other woman. I only wanted you. And yet, you immediately believed that I changed my fiancé at the marriage ceremony. So you didn't trust me. Jealousy blinded me. I realized later that I was wrong. I realized I had wronged you undeservedly, but I couldn't get over my pride. I was hurt when you refused to believe the elevator story. So we both overreacted? That's what it turns out. I was really sorry I left so soon. I wanted to come back, but I found out you were married. I never would have married if I hadn't known you had another woman. Harry assured me you'd been with her a long time and then told me you were having a baby. This news completely threw me off balance. I had no reason not to believe him. I was confused, I was all alone, and the resentment I felt for you all blurred. So what do you mean, Harry lied to me? Of course he did. Why would I want some mythical woman? I didn't want to live without you. I was just angry that you chose my friend over me. Anger and jealousy are bad counselors. I chose to run away instead. I realized it too late. I should have trusted you. And I you. But Harry assured me so convincingly that you had another woman a long time ago. Why would I want another woman? 
Edward asked quietly, taking Nora's hands in his. I still love you. She felt goosebumps run up and down her body at the man's touch. She'd never felt anything like it when Harry touched her. We've wasted so much time speculating about each other and haven't taken the time to sit down and talk. Say, begging, looking at her, Edward asked, Can you ever forgive me? This year has been like a dream. I've been very unhappy without you. Don't you have any love left in your heart for me? I thought I had fallen out of love with you because you cheated, but now I realize I still can't live without you. Everything between Harry and me was a terrible mistake. Darling, exclaimed the joyful Edward. The cafe patrons looked at him perplexedly. You can't imagine how much I've missed you. I don't want to let you go. I want to kiss you, caress you. Why don't we run away from here? Get a hotel room. Let's do it. Goodbye, laughed Nora. I missed you too. It's a shame we lost a whole year because of stupid grudges, but we can make up for it. Edward looked tenderly at the young woman and could not get enough of her. He caressed every feature of her face with his gaze. Waiter! Keeping his eyes on his beloved, he called out to the young man. Bring the bill. They left the cafe, holding hands, got into a cab, and went to the nearest hotel. There they took a room, turned off their cell phones, and began to enjoy each other's intimacy. Margaret. Entering his mother-in-law's apartment, Harry asked her from the doorstep, Do you know where Nora is? I can't get through to her. She's turned her cell phone off for some reason. She should have been back by now. I hope nothing's happened. When was the last time you spoke to her? We had a fight. The woman admitted it. And she left. I don't know where she went. I'm going to try calling her myself. It's really disconnected. Margaret looked at the phone receiver in confusion. Maybe the battery's dead, and she's at her girlfriend's. Did you call them and find out? I called all her friends. The man said worriedly. No one's seen her. I don't know where she could have gone. As long as she's okay, it's not a big deal. Try to reassure my son-in-law, Margaret. Maybe she's already home, went for a walk, and got held up. You go ahead. If I see her, I'll call you. You can rest assured. Yes, I think I'll go. Maybe she really is back already. It's still weird that you didn't tell anyone. Just let me know so I don't worry if she comes home. The woman asked. Okay, I'll keep you posted. Harry returned to the empty house. Nora was gone. He was out of his mind with worry. He was about to run to the police station when the key turned in the lock and Nora appeared on the doorstep. Where have you been? Her husband exclaimed indignantly, looking at her indignantly. I've been looking all over for you. Margaret is worried. I'm not going to report to you. Nora replied calmly. I'm a free woman. Do I have the right to be alone? You're a married woman, and I'm your husband. I need to know where you've been. You won't be a husband for long. The young woman remarked, I'm filing for divorce, and this issue is out of the question. Do not try to dissuade. I've already tolerated a whole year, but now I've finally made up my mind. We can't be together. What? The man screamed. Explain to me what happened in the few hours you were away from home. What fly bit you? Are you drunk? I met Edward. Nora answered. He told me everything. It turns out you've been lying to me all this time. He's never had a woman. And he's never been a happy father. Why did you make all that up? I don't understand. You don't. Harry clenched his fingers into fists, so white his knuckles turned white, his eyes bloodshot. And I'll tell you, it's all because of you. Edward has always had the best in life, a job, a car, an apartment, a woman. Everything was easy, and I had to make my way through life the hard way. 
He's the lucky one, and I'm the loser. But now I have the most desirable woman in the world, and no one can stop me. It was worth it. You're my wife. He gave you up, and I'm not going to share you with anyone. You're crazy, Nora said in horror. Her heart clenched with fear. She was afraid he was going to hit her. Yes, Harry's eyes burned with feverish fire. I've gone mad with love for you. Is that a crime? I won't give you to anyone, do you hear? You will stay with me. I won't let anyone else have you. No one will love you as I do. Edward is not capable of that kind of love. You're mine, do you understand? Mine and no one else's. I will destroy anyone who gets in my way. Harry, I don't love you and I never will. I've always been honest with you. Why torture each other? But I love you. That's enough for me. Let me go, please. Nor begged. We're both suffering. No way. I won't give you a divorce. You'll stay here with me. And if anyone dares to take you away from me, I will stop at nothing. Nora was scared, not for herself, for Edward. All right, calm down, please. The woman realized it was best to backtrack now. I'm not going anywhere. Good for you. Satisfied, Harry slowly began to calm down. Why do you want that traitor? You think he's changed. You'll thank me for saving you from him. Have you forgotten how much you suffered? How I pulled you out of your depression? No, I won't let him anywhere near you. That evening, after waiting for Harry to fall asleep, she locked herself in the bathroom, turned on the water, and called Edward. If you could have seen it, she told him. What did he look like when he found out you were back? I've never seen him like that. Do you want me to talk to him myself? The man asked. I'm begging you. Let's just leave it as it is for now, shall we? She asked. I'll try to talk to him again, only a little later. He must realize that it's impossible to live with someone you don't love. You could just leave with me. Edward suggested it. Leave him, let him live his life as he likes. After all, you can get a divorce through the courts. No, I don't want to do that. I've got to get him to sign the petition. Time passed, and Harry never let his wife out of his sight, supervising her at home, at work, accompanying her everywhere. Nora couldn't find the right occasion to talk. Why are you so pale? One day Hare asked, concerned about his wife's condition. I've been sick this morning, she confessed. Are you ill? No, it's something else. I'm, I'm pregnant. You're pregnant. Nora saw her husband's face change. With what? Tell me, bitch. He grabbed her shoulders painfully, pushing her against the wall. But don't touch me, the woman said warningly. You yourself always wanted children. Oh, I see. It suddenly dawned on Harry. You slept with him. Cheated on me? How could you get mixed up with that traitor again? After everything I've done for you? What were you hoping for? Did you think I wouldn't find out? Let it be known that I can't have children. I had the mumps when I was a kid. I loved you, but you deceived me, trampled on my feelings, let that scoundrel crush me. You and Great, he swung at her. Nora squirmed, expecting him to hit her, but instead he slammed the room door with all his might. Shards of broken glass spattered pitifully. Yes, I cheated on you, and I wasn't going to hide it. Nora looked directly at her husband. I'm asking you to give me a divorce. Let's part amicably. Let me go. How could I have been so wrong about you? Harry looked at her with regret. I thought I was the best of women, and you're just like everyone else. It's all Edward's fault. He has to go away. Yes, when he's gone... Will you stop thinking about him and love me? No. Nora shrieked in horror and tried to hold Harry. You wouldn't dare hurt him. Stop it, Harry. You're making a terrible mistake. I'll never love you anyway. 
I was grateful for this year until I found out you told me the truth. How are you better than Edward? Don't you dare compare me to him. Harry roared. He abandoned you, and I tried to save you. But it wasn't his fault, and you know it as well as I do. Oh, so you're protecting him? You're afraid for his worthless life? He'll pay for everything. I won't let him destroy everything I've built. I had a family, a wife I loved, and then this handsome man shows up again. I'm left with a broken home again. But no, I won't let you. I know what I have to do. Nora grabbed his arm, and he pushed her away from him. Furious, Harry grabbed his jacket and ran out of the apartment, slamming the door loudly. Nora grabbed the phone. Edward, Edward. She kept crying. Pick up the phone. Please, my love. I wouldn't survive if anything happened to you. But the man didn't answer. What should I do? I have to warn him somehow. Harry's capable of anything in his condition. What am I supposed to do? I have to go to him. Right. What am I doing sitting here? Cab. Yeah, we should call a cab. She said as she dialed the number of the cab service. Hello, young lady, would you have a car, please? The woman gave the address. In a few minutes, she was already sitting in the car, continuing to dial her lover's number from time to time. Her anxiety was growing. Not remembering herself, she went up to Edward's apartment. Oh, my God, she said when she saw that the door to the apartment was ajar. Am I too late? Her insides were shaking, and on unbendable legs, she strode into the living room and cried out desperately, Edward, my love. The man was lying on the floor in a pool of blood. She fell to her knees in front of him, fumbling for a pulse, frantically dialing the ambulance number. Ambulance? Crying, Nora shouted into the phone. A man is dying here. Help me, quick. Edward, are you alive, my dearly beloved? The woman stroked his hair, leaned over and kissed him. Say something, I beg you. Call me back. Don't die. Don't leave me. The man was silent. His face was dead pale. The doctors arrived about ten minutes later, quickly assessed the situation. Who are you to the victim? The doctor asked sternly, And how did you get into the apartment? I am. I'm his fiancé. The apartment was open, so I went in. The victim's head is smashed, and he's unconscious. I'll have to call the police. Yes, do what you have to do. You'll have to wait for the police to arrive and tell them what happened. But I didn't see anything. I came in and Edward was already on the floor. You'll still have to explain yourself to the police. We can't stay here. Your friend needs to be in intensive care right away. But I wanted to come with you. Your fiancé is still unconscious. You're more important. Come back later when he comes to his senses. The doctor gave me the address of the hospital. Nora was afraid to be alone in the apartment, afraid that Harry might come back. The young woman flinched when the doorbell rang. Open up, police. She heard it and opened the door. The police inspected the apartment. They found no signs of forced entry nor did they find the crime weapon. Who could have done it? The investigator asked her directly. Do you have any idea? I think my husband did it, Harry. Didn't you say the victim was your fiancé? My husband and I were getting a divorce. It's a very complicated story. Well, interesting. The coroner sat down in a chair in the living room, put his foot on his leg. Tell me your story. Young lady in detail. Nora told everything, starting with her and Edward's wedding. So you think your husband might have hit Edward? I'm afraid he did. Wiping away her tears, Nora said. We'd had a fight, and I asked him to give me a divorce. He became furious, threatened, and then ran here. I didn't have time to warn Edward. And where is Harry now? 
You don't know. Did you call him? No, I never saw him again. Do you have a key to this apartment? No. The door was open when I got here. The landlord must have let him in if the door was intact. Of course, Edward didn't feel threatened because they were best friends. Okay, we'll figure it out, but you guys be careful. Your husband seems to have some mental issues. Have you noticed any signs of aggression before? No, just today. Usually he's always calm and composed. I don't know what's gotten into him. He took the news of the divorce very painfully, but I didn't expect such a reaction from him. I think that kind of aggression, sooner or later, would have manifested itself towards you or someone else. It happens that a person behaves like a perfectly healthy person, but one day a trigger goes off and he can no longer control himself. Apparently, that trigger was the news of the divorce, so you'd better find somewhere to stay until we find Harry. I'm afraid you might be in danger, too. No. The woman said, He won't touch me. He loves me too much. I wouldn't be so sure. The man shook his head doubtfully. The investigator left. Nora closed the apartment and drove to the hospital. You can't see him. A nurse tried to stop her. He's in intensive care. They won't let anyone in. Leave your number. We'll let you know when the patient comes to. Please, I'm begging you. Will you let me stay with him? I'll be quiet. I won't interfere. I want him to see me first when he opens his eyes. I can nurse him. All right? The girl's given up. Just put on a robe. Make sure you wear a mask, cap, and booties. This is an intensive care unit and be quiet, or I'll get a beating from the doctor. If he shows up, disappear as soon as I tell you. Okay. Okay, thank you. I'd do anything to stay close to the one I love. Nora sat in the room next to Edward and cried. It's all my fault, she thought. Why? Why did I agree to marry Harry? I didn't love him. I knew I didn't love him. I knew I'd never love him. I let myself be deceived. Fool. All I want is Edward. My darling. She whispered, kissing his hand. Just wake up, please. I love you so much. We're going to live happily ever after, and we'll never part again. I won't let you go anywhere, and I'll trust only you. My darling, my only one. Nora spent the whole night by Edward's side. In the morning, she fell into a restless sleep, dozing in her chair and holding Edward's hand tightly. She woke up every now and then during the night to see if he was awake. Tired, she laid her head in her arms on the edge of the bed and fell into sleep. When she woke up to someone stroking her hair, the woman lifted her head, shook it, shaking off the remnants of sleep, and straightened up. Edward was looking at her, smiling. Are you awake? She breathed out, tears of joy showing in her eyes. How are you feeling? Not bad. Just a headache and thirsty. I'll get the doctor right away. Nora jumped up ran out into the corridor. Nurse, tell the doctor Edward's awake. Wait a minute, I'll give you something to drink. She quickly poured a glass of water and handed it to him. How frightened I was when I found you on the floor in a pool of blood. How did I end up here? I don't remember much. He tried to get up. Lie down, you can't move. The woman stopped him. The doctor will be here in a minute. You'll have to get out of here. A nurse entered the room, looked at the patient. Go home, you need to rest. The doctor will examine him, prescribe treatment, and come back in the evening. I think he'll be able to talk to you by then. Don't miss him. Nora leaned over Edward, kissed him. I'll be right back. I promise not to be long. The woman walked out of the hospital and wondered, Where will I go? If Harry is still in custody, it's not safe to go home. To my mother's, but that would mean putting her in danger, too. 
Harry could meet me at her house. Go to Edward's? I don't think Harry will be looking for me there. I've got the keys with me. That's right. It's probably the safest place. As the young woman pondered, the phone rang. Nora, hello. It's the investigator. The man gave his last name. We have your husband in custody. You have nothing to fear. We have him in custody, and he's already confessing. Could you come to the investigative committee? You'll thank me for saving you from him. Have you forgotten how much you suffered? How I pulled you out of your depression? No, I won't let him anywhere near you. That evening, after waiting for Harry to fall asleep, she locked herself in the bathroom, turned on the water, and called Edward. If you could have seen it, she told him. What did he look like when he found out you were back? I've never seen him like that. Do you want me to talk to him myself? The man asked. I'm begging you. Let's just leave it as it is for now, shall we? She asked. I'll try to talk to him again, only a little later. He must realize that it's impossible to live with someone you don't love. You could just leave with me. Edward suggested it. Leave him, let him live his life as he likes. After all, you can get a divorce through the courts. No, I don't want to do that. I've got to get him to sign the petition. Time passed, and Harry never let his wife out of his sight, supervising her at home, at work, accompanying her everywhere. Nora couldn't find the right occasion to talk. Why are you so pale? One day Hare asked, concerned about his wife's condition. I've been sick this morning, she confessed. Are you ill? No, it's something else. I'm, I'm pregnant. You're pregnant. Nora saw her husband's face change. With what? Tell me, bitch. He grabbed her shoulders painfully, pushing her against the wall. Don't touch me, the woman said warningly. You yourself always wanted children. Oh, I see. It suddenly dawned on Harry. You slept with him. Cheated on me? How could you get mixed up with that traitor again? After everything I've done for you? What were you hoping for? Did you think I wouldn't find out? Let it be known that I can't have children. I had the mumps when I was a kid. I loved you, but you deceived me, trampled on my feelings, let that scoundrel crush me. You and Great, he swung at her. Nora squirmed, expecting him to hit her, but instead he slammed the room door with all his might. Shards of broken glass spattered pitifully. Yes, I cheated on you, and I wasn't going to hide it. Nora looked directly at her husband. I'm asking you to give me a divorce. Let's part amicably. Let me go. How could I have been so wrong about you? Harry looked at her with regret. I thought I was the best of women, and you're just like everyone else. It's all Edward's fault. He has to go away. Yes, when he's gone, will you stop thinking about him and love me? No. Nora shrieked in horror and tried to hold Harry. You wouldn't dare hurt him. Stop it, Harry. You're making a terrible mistake. I'll never love you anyway. I was grateful for this year until I found out you told me the truth. How are you better than Edward? Don't you dare compare me to him. Harry roared. He abandoned you, and I tried to save you. But it wasn't his fault, and you know it as well as I do. Oh, so you're protecting him? You're afraid for his worthless life? He'll pay for everything. I won't let him destroy everything I've built. I had a family, a wife I loved, and then this handsome man shows up again. I'm left with a broken home again. But no, I won't let you. I know what I have to do. Nora grabbed his arm, and he pushed her away from him. Furious, Harry grabbed his jacket and ran out of the apartment slamming the door loudly. Nora grabbed the phone. Edward, Edward. She kept crying. Pick up the phone. Please, my love. I wouldn't survive if anything happened to you. But the man didn't answer. 
What should I do? I have to warn him somehow. Harry's capable of anything in his condition. What am I supposed to do? I have to go to him. Right. What am I doing sitting here? Cab. Yeah, we should call a cab. She said as she dialed the number of the cab service. Hello, young lady, would you have a car, please? The woman gave the address. In a few minutes, she was already sitting in the car, continuing to dial her lover's number from time to time. Her anxiety was growing. Not remembering herself, she went up to Edward's apartment. Oh, my God, she said when she saw that the door to the apartment was ajar. Am I too late? Her insides were shaking, and on unbendable legs, she strode into the living room and cried out desperately, Edward, my love.